Chapter One of Blessed Edmund Campion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Blessed Edmund Campion by Lois Imogen Guinea. Chapter One Youth. London, Oxford, 1540 through 1566. The Campion family seem to have been both gentlefolk and yeomen, and to have been widely scattered over the land, in Northamptonshire, Warwickshire, Essex, Sussex, and Devon. Nothing is definitely known at present as to which branch of the Campion family the blessed Edmund belonged. Unlike many of the martyrs of Tudor and Stuart times, he was what is called a born Catholic, in more accurate phrase a born heathen as we all are but baptized in his parents religion soon after his birth in london on the feast of st paul the apostle january twenty fifth in the year fifteen forty new style edmund had two brothers and a sister none of whom played any great part in his after life by the time he entered the society of jesus his father and mother were both dead his written expression is that he had hopes they died in full communion with the church but evidently he did not know being abroad how it had fared with him in those terribly stormy days for christian souls edmund campion senior was a bookseller evidently in good standing but not well to do some rich london guildsmen probably of the grocer's company for it was they who maintained him later befriended the promising little boy at just the right moment when his father was reluctantly going to apprentice him to a trade and he was sent at their joint expense to a good grammar school afterwards under the same patrons he entered christ hospital then lately set up in newgate street out of confiscated franciscan funds and the generosity of londoners as the foundation of the sixteen-year-old king edward the sixth here the small edmund full of life and laughter banded and belted ran about in now extinct yellow petticoats and one of the earliest pairs of those historic yellow stockings he was thirteen and quite famous already in the schoolboy world of london for his learning and his attractive presence and speech when queen mary tudor who had just succeeded to the english throne enter her city in state out of many hundred eligible youngsters it was he who was chosen to stand up before her on a street platform under the shadow of the old st paul's cathedral and shrilly welcome her in the latin tongue the queen sat on a white horse robed in gold embroidered dark velvet crimson or purplish with a great sword carried before her by the boyish earl of surrey with eight thousand mounted lords and gentlemen on either side all the glittering ambassadors and a bevy of beautifully apparelled ladies on certain figures in that splendid and noisy pageant the child might have looked with pensive eyes had he been able to forecast his own future as it was he cannot have failed to observe the queen's younger sister the thin watchful spirited girl who was known as the lady elizabeth another was there of high office though not of high descent who was all goodness piety and generosity and may well have been drawn to notice edmund campion for the first time on that sunshiny afternoon in august fifteen fifty three this was sir thomas white then lord mayor of london a staunch catholic he was an unlearned man and childless who became later co-founder of the merchant tailor's school and enricher of many towns by fifteen fifty five he had opened his college of st john baptist once a cistercian house at oxford the grocer's company at once approached him to admit their blue coat ward as a scholar this he did and conceived almost as soon a marked attachment to him and two years later when edmund was not yet eighteen he made him a senior fellow campion's other early friends at the university were his first tutor john bevend and gregory martin 
a foundation scholar like himself these two showed towards him a lifelong devotion mary's troubled reign had covered the five most susceptible years of his youth and restored to the country despite its legal excesses a definitely catholic tone things were soon to change war by statute against the mass was first declared in fifteen fifty nine edmund campion had left oxford by the time that st john's deprived of president after president by the royal commissioners was swept away of all the dons who favored or in any degree tolerated the jurisdiction of that apostolic see which safeguarded the doctrine and honor of the blessed eucharist but while he lived in his university world he lived untouched he was not looked upon as a catholic nor was he such if his heart could be fully judged by his outward actions buried in literature philosophy and pleasant tutorial work he had become in his cultured indifference what st jerome's accusing vision called a ciceronian and not a christian a skin-deep ciceronian however there is only a bare possibility that on preceding m a in fifteen sixty four he escaped taking the wretched oath of supremacy and thereby acknowledging the queen as head in spirituals as well as temporals within her realm of england he stretched his conscience as many were doing thinking to help along the unity of faith thereby defeating that unity for good and all an almost unprecedented vogue at oxford had served to blind him he was so happy so busy so needed so much at home there friends encouraged him undergraduates flocked about him and imitated his very gait and tone as they never have imitated any one else except newman campion was a famous latin scholar and he was a good grecian and a good hebraist greek and hebrew were studies newly revived just before he was born he spoke as well as he wrote the flamboyant art of oratory now almost extinct in our more quiet-coloured century was then much studied and admired and campion was famous for debates and addresses and encomiums when only twenty he had been called upon to preach though a layman at the reburial of poor amy robsart lord dudley's young wife in the university church of st mary the virgin and this he did with great grace and animation and with no small display of tact for rumors of a murder with a motive had already got abroad such prominence may have come to campion through st thomas white's request sir thomas had his associations with cumnor four years later edmund campion was able to put sincere love and sincere grief into a funeral oration this time a latin not an english one for the good and dear founder himself whose body was solemnly interred in the chapel of his college in september fifteen sixty six queen elizabeth made the first and happier of her two visits to oxford and the queen's train was dudley also a quieter plainer less noticed man but one out of all comparison with him for astute power this was sir william cecil the prime minister afterwards known far and wide as lord burghley there were farces and tragedies for the queen at oxford there were musical performances theological disputations and other academic sports in front of the vast assemblage stood forth master campion of st john's alone in his rough hood and gown as representative of the university he welcomed smiling royalty and dudley now earl of leicester chancellor of the university and royalty's magnificent favorite campion shone as well in the absurd discussions in natural science which followed the queen and dudley marked him as they could not fail to do for nothing could exceed the courtliness with which he had performed his task the chancellor sent for him in private and expressed the queen's good will whereby campion might bid through him for whatever preferment he chose but campion always truly modest and full of ironic humor as well would ask of his patron nothing he said 
but his continued regard the young bookman had a real liking for the vicious worldling liked by several sensitively good men then and since sir william cecil also took instinctive interest in campion and his eager dialectics altogether there was no more popular man in oxford or elsewhere campion was on the hilltop of professional and personal success in all this beautiful fountain play of the things which are seen he was running the very gravest risk of spiritual ruin perhaps he could not know in his leaf-hung hermitage what a tremendous muster of souls was going on now that the ancient church and the new statecraft were to fight it out in england queen elizabeth's quarrel with the pope was hardly more doctrinal than her royal father's had been she too would have been quite content to live all her days as a catholic provided that catholicism would prove her slave the battle was not between two known religions on one side was conservative england with a belief on the other the strong spirit of secularism plus a few fanatics formed not by the english but the continental reformation religion in itself troubled the court party as little as anything could possibly do it was because the spirit of catholicism seemed to them to threaten their particular kind of national pride and to interfere with their particular kind of worldly prosperity that cromwell in one great tudor reign burghley in the other tried to put it down they wished to get good citizenship acknowledged not as an ideal but as the supreme ideal and they cared not how much else was shoveled out of the way their only use for religion was to bring it well under the authority of the law and the supremacy of the crown they had no objection to high respectability but a most violent objection to the supernatural life because that gives to those who practice it a dangerous independence elizabeth wanted unity and peace her subjects were to be forced by statute to pray less and to pray all alike and to be thereby trained somehow to put sacraments and saints and the papacy out of their heads english humankind were to forsake their happy wild life as it were in the church universal and all become as if by magic one large tame pet lying in a ribbon collar on the royal hearth this is a vision which has appealed to many another head of commonwealth as desirable though unaccountably difficult some worthy persons had brought themselves to believe that nothing to speak of happened at the reformation but at the time everybody understood in the clearest fashion that an old moral system which would not come to terms had been dropped and a more satisfactory one created it was a working theory of that age all over europe that a governor had the right to fix the belief of subjects what was wanted in england was made to order out of the rags of ruined doctrine and discipline foreign protestants raged over its externals as having too much of the old thing but the bullying state riding roughshod over convocation and the laity was perfectly at ease knowing that there was more than enough of the new thing to color the whole and to color it once and forever there was no affection for continuity in these days except among the romans the attitude of their persecutors was that of men in a fury that any englishman should dare to connect himself either with the world at large or with his country's own disclaimed yesterday the state trials for instance bear this out in a score of places many an official answer resembles the one made to that interesting character blessed ralph sherwin when he said truly that his coming back to his own land was to persuade the people to catholic unity you well know so the council reproved him in westminster hall that it was not lawful for you to persuade the queen's subjects to any other religion than by her highness's instructions is already professed the received religion or as it was quite as often called the queen's religion was simply the new idea of nationalism torn away from relationship to the arch ideas of nations which is the law of god it was in practice no adoring angel at the altar 
but a capable parish beetle at the door now this was never the catholic conception of what religion has been or is meant to be happily many thoroughly patriotic englishmen felt that no least jot of christian revelation however much it stood in the way of caesar could with their consent be put by and to keep it free they were willing to make themselves very disagreeable indeed to their revered sovereign and to their more easy-going countrymen with that rude definiteness which is ever their chief family trait the better catholics threw their full force against the oaths of supremacy and acts of uniformity as soon as they understood their meaning the centuries passed since they proved that they had succeeded in holding asunder what the queen would join together was it unreasonable that she punished the men who tried to spoil her dream and almost the chief of these men edmund campion was destined to be though years were to pass before he lent his whole heart to the works god willed him to do End of chapter one Chapter 2 of Blessed Edmund Campion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Imogene Guiney. Chapter 2 The Hour of Unrest, Oxford, Dublin, 1566 to 1570 thousands who were comfortably placed in life and conscientious too had a great deal to suffer until things were made plain edmund campion began to fret and argue and ponder and pray for light in secret for several years going about that most ingenious place as the later lover called oxford with heavy thoughts oxford itself despite the ecclesiastical commission fixed there to worry it was more catholic in spirit than any other city in england nevertheless campion's temptation to conform was very great we must remember that many of his first impressions and memories were anglican he was brought up during his early school life on the new liturgy which came into operation before his tenth year he knew now in manhood that to change about and forsake the state religion for the only church which is as exacting as her master, would be to see the ruin of his happy career. His strong point in the beginning was not what is called brute courage. His was the nervous, hamlet-like temper, natural to students and recluses, which by a fatal error puts endless thinking into what needs only to be done. During these years Campion read a great deal of theology, as in his position he was bound to do according to university rules where everything else except his inmost heart inclined him to heresy the fathers drove him back upon the fullness of revealed truth the day which he spent with saint augustine or saint jerome or saint john chrysostom was the day on which to catch up the phrase of his friend and biographer father robert parsons himself a balloyal man he was ready to pull out this thorn of conscience but on the morrow returned the old spirit of obstinacy and delay meanwhile the anglican influence was gaining for campion's dearest friend of many richard cheney the lord bishop of gloucester was drawing him on towards his own ideals which were catholic-minded if not catholic the learned gentle and lovable cheney withstood with zest the risen puritan party and in his hold on sound doctrine stood apart from all his colleagues on the episcopal bench he had been brought up as a catholic and ordained according to the full catholic ritual in fifteen thirty four the reminder is sometimes needed that protestants did not shoot up full grown that all original protestantism was made up of human material once catholic from first to last however cheney could not be forced to coerce the church which he had abandoned in this he stood not as has been stated quite alone among the elizabethan bishops 
from downham of chester and guest of rochester shared his honourable abstinence though in less degree the moment cheney was out of the way the catholics on his diocesan ground hitherto safe were mercilessly harried he had been made a bishop against his will displacing the true occupant of the see when his friend edmund campion was two and twenty in most matters cheney followed luther cranmer's more heretical doctrines which prevailed on all sides in england he thoroughly hated he longed always for a reconciliation which was never to be and never can be he longed to see the catholics against the well-thought-out and oft-repeated prohibition of their leaders between fifteen sixty two and sixteen o six do a little evil to procure a great good namely smooth matters over escape their terribly severe penalties and in the end become able to leaven the lump of english error by the mere preliminary of attendance at the service of common prayer according to law in their own old parish churches the book of common prayer as he would remind them was expressly designed to suit persons of various and even contradictory religious views catholic not so very catholic ex-catholic non-catholic anti-catholic campion often rode over the hills to gloucester to sit by the episcopal hearth fire book on knee and hear such theories as this and sympathize with the lonely old man who saw visions and had little else in his vexed life to content him his strong double desire was to save by his own effort for the church of england separated from rome that great body of ancient belief and practice sure otherwise to be lost in the flood of invited calvinism and to secure edmund campion himself as his intellectual coadjutor and successor as one of high gifts likely to drink in his thoughts and become his heir the two were together not only in matters of dogma but in all minor points cheney shared with campion dislike of politics telling the council that in such matters he was a man of small experience and little observation he kept his old priestly ideals and would never marry campion too chose to be a celibate if he gave his heart to either church he saw even then that it must be an undivided heart to him with his underlying tenderness towards the ancient faith and his dream of peacemaking through compromise which is so english and just in these matters so mistaken the mission thus opened out appealed half reluctantly yet not realizing the disloyalty of his act as he himself tells us he allowed himself to receive from cheney's hands deacon's orders in the church of england his interior struggle from this day forth went from bad to worse with the unaffected simplicity of his character he talked over his difficulties not only with cheney but with any one at oxford who seemed able to help him as a consequence the grocer's company whose exhibition he still held heard rumors grew uneasy and began to suspect him ending in fifteen sixty eight by inviting campion up to london to save his credit by preaching at paul's cross and publicly favoring as they expressed it the religion now authorized he begged for time and that being granted for more time he attended a court of the company in order to plead engagements and to say that he was not his own man while deep in academic duties and at the service of undergraduates divers worshipful men's children he calls them he was public orator and proctor in fact by now as well as fellow and tutor of his college he never resided long enough to take his doctor's degree he exacted from the company a written statement of the dogmas he was expected to avow and finding it impossible to subscribe to the hot heterodoxy thus laid down he cut his first tether by resigning his exhibition 
his most brilliant colleague at st john's gregory martin who had protested in vain against campion's diaconate which was to cause the recipient extreme remorse for a long time had become a convert to catholicism and sacrificed all his secular prospects he wrote to his dear friend to warn him against ambition and to urge on him escape from moral bondage come the fervent letter cried if we two can but live together we can live on nothing if this be too little i have money and if this also fails one thing is left they that sow in tears shall reap in joy such earnest words though seeming wasted had their share in shaking edmund campion's rest with the summer term of fifteen seventy his proctorate expired he spent the long vacation in tutoring the eight years old harry vox eldest son of lord vox of harrowden who afterwards beautifully redeemed his childish promise the end of michaelmas term found campion face to face for the last time with that life which he had so loved and in which his scientific enthusiasm for letters he had been such a wonderful inspiration to young men there was no conscious motive in his heart deeper than a thirst for such freedom as had become difficult in the puritanizing university when he cut himself loose slipped out of it for good and took ship for ireland in the new move he had the approbation of leicester and the companionship of a much attached oxford disciple richard stanhurst who is remembered by posterity only for his grotesque translation of virgil campion may well have left home with the understanding that he should have a clear educational field in dublin but he arrived a little too late the outlook had been very bright some good men then in power were eager for the revival of the extinct university of dublin an ancient papal foundation but ruined as all the great schools were most of them permanently some only temporarily by the religious changes the chief supporters of the plan were enthusiastic far-sighted and most liberally inclined towards catholics fear and prejudice therefore stepped in in the person of elizabeth's irish bishops the lord chancellor dr weston wrote privately to the queen deploring the popularity of the scheme and begging her to take the unborn foundation into her merciful motherly care she followed that advice in token thereof in due season arose trinity college dublin as a complete checkmate to the earlier project quite safe for evermore from papist blight thus was campion cheated of a continuance of his natural vocation in serving upon the staff of the new university two of his friends who had most concern in it were james stanhurst father of richard and sir henry sidney then lord deputy of ireland who had proffered it lands and money leicester would have provided campion with a letter of introduction to sir henry his own brother-in-law the latter's young son philip was at this time a student in oxford where his governor thomas thornton of christ church afterwards vice-chancellor had been constantly in campion society sir henry sidney always bore himself most kindly towards campion the latter lived a more than welcome guest under the roof of james stanhurst then recorder of dublin and speaker of the local house of commons stanhurst was the head of an anglo-irish family not openly catholic since queen mary's reign indeed in his public capacity he had often sided against catholicism although he was as friendly as sidney himself to those who professed it in the midst of this temporizing household campion himself a temporizer came during the winter to be doubted by certain bigots outside very possibly he was too free-spoken campion came to ireland believing in practically all catholic dogmas 
even in the eucharist and in the authority of the council of trent the impression may have got abroad that this then unknown variety of anglicanism differed little from the dangerous creed of times past lately discovered to be the proper business of the police whatever the reason campion began to be a marked man sir henry sidney told stanhurst with heat that so long as he was governor he would see to it that no busy knave of them all should trouble him on campion's account under this unpleasant circumstance of espial added to the disappointment he had just undergone the sensitive exile presently fell ill and got a most affectionate nursing from the stanhursts till his strength revived he started as soon to write a treatise on the subject of which his mind up to now had been full the character and aim of the ideal youth at the universities this de juvene academico reminds us of a theme by another great oxonian who was in dublin three hundred years later and had also to face the heartbreaking failure of an irish university dreamed of and not to be campion afterwards recast his fine little work and under its second form it is to be found among the few opuscula published after his death his comely face and gracious manner were quickly taken into favour in his dublin circle while he was gaining a contrary repute on hearsay the few who had access to him nicknamed him the angel meanwhile hating idleness and bent on redeeming what may have looked like a foolish absence from oxford campion planned the composition of a brief history of ireland friends helped him in inquiring out antiquities of the land he was what we should call a thorough researcher a bird by no means common in those early days he went here and there among musty manuscript records of the city and from library to library in the country happily gathering in his materials for work he had been some three months in ireland when on a march midnight there came a sudden warning from the faithful lord deputy who was on the point of leaving for england campion learned thereby that weston the chancellor had pursuivants ready to arrest him the next morning the stanhursts acted at once and hurried their friend into the care of sir christopher barnwall and dame marion sherry his wife of turvey house in the parish of dunabate eight miles away there breathless with the sudden flight through the dark the three devoted escorts left him in safety end of chapter two recording by john brandon chapter three of blessed edmund campion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by john brandon blessed edmund campion by louise imogene Guiney. chapter three steps forward ireland fifteen seventy one the barnwalls were in feeling both more catholic and more irish than the stanhursts and they showed edmund campion a no less tender hospitality the great house was in a beautiful and remote situation running in and out of it was a horde of laughing children including the eleven-year-old janet who was to become richard stanhurst's early dying wife campion loved the hardy knight their father and their lady mother whom he calls in very sooth a most gentle and godly woman though he mingled freely with the life of the family he was considerably given the great garret to write in and hide in here he began his little history first of all though he sent back a grateful missive in latin to the men who had been so providently kind to him 
to the recorder he says was i not fortunate in such friendship and patronage as yours how good how generous it was of you to take in an unknown stranger and to keep him all these months on the fat of the land you looked after my health as carefully as after richard's the son worthy of your love you supplied me too with books and made the best possible provision for my time of study may i perish if ever in this world outside my room in oxford i had sweeter dealings with the muses up to this i have had to thank you for conveniences but now i must thank you for my rescue and my very breath yes breath is just the word for they who succumb to these persecutors are wont to be thrust into dismal dungeons where they inhale filthy fogs and are cut off from wholesome air but now through you and your children's kindness i shall live please god most happily the stress laid in this affectionate letter upon the writer's appreciation of personal care of privacy dear to students of good diet and pure air tells its own tale of physical delicacy campion was slight in build and like many another tireless and quenchless spirit known to history had no time really strong he ends by asking that his saint bernard may be sent on to him and encloses a lively page for his friend richard recalling the service rendered in snatching him from danger and conveying him to turvey house is it not hard campion breaks out that beholden to you as i am i have no way of showing it meanwhile if these buried relics have any flavor of the old campion their flavor is for you you and your brother walter you up that whole night through and he summoned to us from his wife's side seriously i owe you much i have nothing to write about unless you have time and inclination for a laugh have you then hold your breath and listen the day after i came here as i sat down to work into the bedroom burst a poor old soul coming on what business i wot not she knew nothing of me so seeing me suddenly at her left took me for a ghost her hair rose on end she went dead white she stared aghast her jaw fell what is the matter quoth i whereupon she almost collapsed with fright not a syllable could she utter but made shift to flounce out of the room and pour into her mistress's ear how some sort of hideous spectre had appeared to her on the top floor this was repeated to me at supper they called the little old thing in and made her relate her scare we all nearly died with laughter and i was established as quite alive the book put together as was almost all campion's literary work under highly disturbing conditions is unfinished and what there is of it is sketchy and out of proportion one of its charms is its character drawing including the speeches with which after the fashion of livy campion fits the situation by putting them into the mouths of his personages he was a dramatic mind he knew both history and human nature the latter knowledge crops up everywhere in all that he wrote and spoke and did and supplied him with no small share of his power over others the outstanding charm of the history of ireland is its style crisp arresting bright with idiom an idiom so noble and so much his own that one understands the almost breathless admiration with which his generation looked up to him and listened to him but this book like the view of the present state written some seventeen years later by another gentle-hearted englishman the poet spencer is all wrong in its theory that to get any footing in the modern world the mere irishry must be anglicized campion did not know the celts their laws nor their literature he never came nearer to them than through chronicles written in scorn of them or the daily table talk wide of the mark of the english pale 
yet according to his opportunity he loved the country and the people and deplored that the descendants of a race of medieval scholars should be cut off from education afterwards he felt that his rather helter-skelter pamphlet represented limited knowledge and unformed opinion he speaks of it as premature and wished when he lost the manuscript that it might perish rather than reach the public as it was it bore a dedication to the earl of leicester his singular good lord in the hope that it might make his trouble seem neither causeless nor fruitless or as he says again in plainer language i render you my poor book as an account of my voyage it was first printed without supervision from the author in a very muddled unsatisfactory way by raphael hollinshed in 1577 then in more scholarly fashion by sir james ware in his ancient irish histories 1633 we all remember how useful hollinshed's pages were to shakespeare the twenty lines or so of the famous description of wolsey in act four scene two of henry the eighth is taken almost word for word from what campion had written and hollinshed had incorporated in his chronicles nowhere in this little book begun and broken off at turvey house and purposely non-committal in its religious expressions is there any sign that his author had already as some have thought returned to the church for parsons his earliest biographer whose facts concerning these years were supplied by richard stanhurst says of campion that his purity and devoutness in ireland were marked although he was not in the church father pollen summing up the evidence of these written pages considers campion near to the church but distinctly avoiding a confession of faith chancellor weston a zealot of the most pronounced protestant type made a livelier pursuit after having been baffled by campion's escape from dublin the latter found himself quite unable to lead any sort of orderly life thanks to the restless hue and cry after him and one day he recognized with a shock of horror the penalties to which he was exposing the generous friends so far unmolested who were giving him shelter his conscience would not allow him to come out with a flat denial of catholic tenets or sympathies his only alternative after a half year in ireland was flight homeward here once more he was aided though they were in great sorrow at his decision by his anglo-irish friends those dear friends whichever after he loved most entirely and they him richard stanhurst a private tutor to the children of the earl of kildare had acquaintance with the earl steward melchior hussey this man a character by no means admirable was about to embark at drogheda for a visit to england and it was arranged that campion should be disguised to pass as his irish servant thus in the month of may putting himself under the special patronage of the national saint and adopting his name campion boarded the ship as mr patrick officers of the law promptly appeared on the track of the quasi papist delaying the weighing of the anchor annoying the crew upsetting the cargo and questioning every passenger on deck except the harmless-looking person who stood in a lackey's weed behind hussey edmund campion was a born actor he put on and kept up a highly stupid expression while he was praying with might and main for st patrick's intercession in his great danger he had cause to thank his new patron in heaven although the party of searchers swooped upon his bags below deck and carried off with them the rough draft of his precious manuscript that history of ireland which he was to see no more for many a year the early summer of fifteen seventy one was ill-starred various startling events had joined like tidal waves 
to list the misbehaving English government up to its highest pitch of alarm. Chief of these was the bull of deposition against Queen Elizabeth, issued by the Holy See after consultation with many temperate English advisers. John Felton, a gentleman of Southwark, posted a copy of it upon the palace gates of the Bishop of London on the morning of May 25th the feast of corpus christi by august he was to pay for the bold act with his life the queen of scots had newly arrived in england london by the time campion reached it was in a ferment nothing was to be found there but fears suspicions arrestings condemnations tortures executions the queen and council were so troubled that they could not tell whom to trust, and so fell to rigorous proceedings against all, but especially against Catholics, whom they most feared, so that Campion could not tell where to rest in England, all men being in fear and jealousy one of another. Campion had not broken his old bonds, yet nothing interested him so powerfully as the things of religion the love of god was lying in wait for him and forced his hand of all possible places in london where he might have gone on the twenty sixth or twenty seventh of may he chose westminster hall in order to attend the trial of dr john story former principal of broadgates hall pembroke college in oxford and that university's first regis professor of civil law dr story was very feeble for his years which were sixty-seven by a wretched breach of international law he had been trapped at antwerp carried away from his wife and family to england and arraigned for having feloniously and traitorously comforted richard norton his own friend the old hero of the pilgrimage of grace but the real cause of his arrest and execution was a much larger matter he was a troublesomely consistent person he had spoken out in the house of commons against the new liturgy in the first parliament of edward the sixth and against the supremacy bill in the first parliament of queen elizabeth he had been an ecclesiastical commissioner under queen mary fox in the famous book of martyrs lies in the most reckless way about story's part in those sordid bygone persecutions and hollingshead and stripe and many another historian repeat fox story was an honorable and even merciful man but a man of his time people were much of a piece in the sixteenth century when it came to holding to the grindstone the nose of the unwilling there is this to be said however that the marian courts dealt out death to heretics and malcontents and candidly stopped there and were not inspired to any cruelty more subtle whereas good queen bess not only dealt out death very much more liberally but invented a poison for all the springs of life her statutes terribly oppressive from the first ended in what burke calls the most hateful code framed since the world began penal laws which especially from fifteen eighty five on struck without mercy at catholics in their rights of worship property inheritance education travel professions public service and private liberties of every kind another point to be noted in passing is that queen mary persecuted her subjects for changing their religion her more ingenuous sister persecuted them for not changing it historians have not dwelt much upon the difference but to a reader with some philosophy in him it will have no little weight dr story was executed five days after his trial under even more horrible circumstances than were usual edmund campion had left england after an exceedingly short stay his standing watch in westminster hall 
had done more for him than many arguments and exhortations it kindled a spark in him which made him in lord falkland's phrase ready for the utmost hazard of war there was a cause to which he could run home there was a vocation to which he could climb these opened out before him as he stood in the surging indoor crowd he was animated by that blessed man's example says parsons to any danger and peril for the same faith for which the doctor died edmund campion lost no time there had been enough of that sad old game and he was thirty-one years old with three-quarters of his too brief life behind him now he was awake and had touched in the dark his heart's long patient master he set out at once for the nearest stronghold of apostolic souls the english seminary at douay in belgium end of chapter three recording by john brandon chapter four of blessed edmund campion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Fatima da Silva Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Imogen Guinea Cheney again Douay, 1571 Interrupted sea voyages were his fate. This time, halfway across the channel, his ship was hailed by a government frigate, the Hare, which demanded to be shown the ship's sailing papers and the passports of her passengers. Campion had none. Moreover, as his religion was suspected, the dutiful Protestant frigate, homeward bound, promptly swallowed him bag and baggage. His generous friends in Ireland had forced upon him money for his needs, and the captain who now kidnapped him found it convenient to keep the money but kind-heartedly let his prisoner lose himself in the streets of dover other friends quickly made the losses good on campion's second attempt to reach calais all went well he did not lack his secular epitaph so to speak at court it was not then a legal crime though it soon became so for a catholic englishman to leave the country fast being made into a hell for him the mighty cecil treated this expatriation as quite voluntary and it is a very great pity he chose to say looking into richard stanihurst's gratified eyes for master campion was one of the diamonds of england the date of campion's reconciliation to the church is unknown it seems unlikely to have taken place in ireland he may have been absolved from his schism in london or else as soon as he had reached douay there was a busy trade in wool still flourishing at that time between flanders and england and in the thrifty kindly towns of the exporting country refugees formed a considerable part of the population Douay, properly speaking, Douay was called Douay by its foster children. The creation of its English seminary was a master stroke of Dr. William Allen, Canon of York, afterwards Cardinal, once of Oriel College, Oxford, and Principal of St. Mary Hall. Indeed, Oxford may be said to have founded Douay. Allen was aided by many men of mark notably by his old tutor morgan phillips and by the latter's bequeathed funds also by the flemish abbots and lay folk campion seems to have been the eighteenth arrival in the newly established house of young prayerful enthusiastic men he found there as professor of hebrew his beloved gregory martin and a learned colleague richard bristow late fellow of exeter college the first of the seminarian priests to be ordained 
two props and pillars of the foundation. There also was Thomas Stapleton, late fellow of New College, the most able Catholic controversialist of the age. Five of the twenty English students enrolled in 1571 joined the Society of Jesus. The college, destined to speedy and splendid development, was affiliated to the Douay University, established some eight years before it by Spanish munificence and the papal bull. Here then Edmund Campion came into his soul's haven, out of the swing of the sea. It was Dr. Allen's missionary policy that all his sons, before memory of them had grown dim at home, should write to their more undecided friends in England, doing what they could to win them to the service of Christ in the Church Catholic. Campion sent a very long document to this end to his venerated and now aging friend, Bishop Cheney, a wonderful letter in that live Elizabethan English, which was bold as surgery itself, yet charged with feeling. Associating his beliefs with Cheney's, as the writer does, he helps us to understand his own doctrinal position while in Oxford and in Dublin. He failed in both places, writes Father Morris, for the same reason. The position was a false one, for it was an effort to serve two masters and to live like a Catholic and teach the Catholic religion outside the pale of the Catholic Church. There is no end or measure, he now tells Cheney from Douay, to my thinking of you, and I never think of you without being horribly ashamed. So often was I with you at Gloucester, so often in your private chamber, with no one near us, when I could have done this business, and I did it not. By this business he means confessing Catholic truth and urging Cheney to return to it. And what is worse, I have added flames to the fever by assenting and assisting. And although you were superior to me in your counterfeited dignity, in wealth, age and learning, and though I was not bound to look after the physicking or dieting of your soul, yet, since you were of so easy and sweet a temper as in spite of your grey hairs to admit me, young as I was, to familiar intercourse with you, to say whatever I chose in all security and secrecy, while you imparted to me your sorrows and all the calumnies of the other heretics against you. And since, like a father, you exhorted me to walk straight and upright in the royal road, to follow the steps of the church, the councils and the fathers, and to believe that where there was a consensus of these, there could be no spot of falsehood. I am very angry with myself that I neglected to you such a beautiful opportunity of recommending the faith, that through false modesty or culpable negligence, I did not address with boldness one who was so near to the kingdom of God. But as I have no longer the occasion that I had of persuading you face to face, it remains that I should send my words to you to witness my regard, my care, my anxiety for you, known to him to whom I make my daily prayer for your salvation. Listen, I beseech you, listen to a few words. You are sixty years old, more or less. Cheney was really sixty-eight. Of uncertain health, of weakened body, the hatred of heretics, the pity of Catholics, the talk of the people, the sorrow of your friends, the joke of your enemies. Who do you think yourself to be? What do you expect? What is your life? Wherein lies your hope? In the heretics hating you so implacably and abusing you so roundly? Because of all heresiarchs, you are the least crazy. Because you confess the living presence of Christ on the altar and the freedom of man's will. Because you persecute no Catholics in your diocese. Because you are hospitable to your townspeople and to good men. Because you plunder not your palace and lands as your brethren do. Surely these things will avail much if you return to the bosom of the church 
if you suffer even the smallest persecution in common with those of the household of faith, or join your prayers with theirs. But now, whilst you are a stranger and an enemy, whilst like a base deserter you fight under an alien flag, it is in vain to attempt to cover your crimes with the cloak of virtues. What is the use of fighting for many articles of the faith, and to perish for doubting of a few? He believes no one article of the faith, who refuses to believe any single one. In vain do you defend the religion of Catholics, if you hug only that which you like, and cut off all that seems not right in your eyes. There is but one plain known road, not enclosed by your palings or mine, not by private judgment, but by the severe laws of humility and obedience. When you wander from these, you are lost. You must be altogether within the house of God, within the walls of salvation, to be sound and safe from all injury. If you wander and walk abroad ever so little, if you carelessly thrust hand or foot out of the ship, if you stir up ever so small a mutiny in the crew, you shall be thrust forth. The door is shut, the ocean roars, you are undone. Do you remember the sober and solemn answer which you gave me when three years ago we met in the house of Thomas Dutton at Shireburn, where we were to dine? We were talking of St. Cyprian. I objected to you, in order to discover your real opinions, that synod of Carthage which erred about the baptism of infants. You answered truly that the Holy Spirit was not promised to one province, but to the church, that the universal church is represented in the full council, and that no doctrine can be pointed out about which such a council ever erred. Acknowledge your own weapons, which you used against the adversaries of the mystery of the Eucharist. Here you have the most apostolic men collected at Trent, to contend for the ancient faith of the fathers. All these, whilst you live as you are living, anathematize you, hiss you out, excommunicate you, abjure you. Campion goes on to urge upon Cheney an outward adherence to the council which had discussed and resolved his own private beliefs. Especially now you have declared war against your colleagues. Why do you not make full submission, without any exceptions, to the discipline of these fathers? Once more, consult your own heart, my poor old friend. Give me back your old beauty, and those excellent gifts which have been hitherto smothered in the mud of dishonesty. Give yourself to your mother, who begot you to Christ, nourished you, consecrated you, acknowledge how cruel and undutiful you have been. Let confession be the salve of your sin. Be merciful to your soul, spare my grief. Your ship is wrecked, your merchandise lost. Nevertheless, seize the plank of penance, and come even naked into the port of the church. Fear not but that Christ will preserve you with his hand, run to meet you, kiss you, and put on you the white garment. Saints and angels will sing for joy. Take no thought for your life. He will take thought for you who gives the beasts their food and feeds the young ravens that call upon him. If you but made trial of our banishment, if you but cleared your conscience and came to behold and consider the living examples of piety which are shown here by bishops, priests, friars, masters of colleges, rulers of provinces, lay people of every age, rank and sex, I believe that you would give up 600 Englands for the opportunity of redeeming the residue of your time by tears and sorrow. Pardon me, my venerated old friend, for these just reproaches and for the heat of my love. Suffer me to hate that deadly disease. Let me ward off the imminent danger of so noble a man and so dear a friend with any dose, however bitter. And now, if Christ give grace and you do not refuse, my hopes of you are equal to my love. 
and I love you as passing excellent in nature, in learning, in gentleness, in goodness, and as doubly dear to me for your many kindnesses and courtesies. If you recover your spiritual health, you make me happy forever. If you slight me, this letter is my witness. God judge between you and me. Your blood be on yourself. Farewell from him that most desires your salvation. One phrase in this steel web of phrases from the pen of a rhetorician with a heart shows that Campion knew of Cheney's sad and now complicated position in England. The letter was written November 1st, 1571. A convocation had met in the preceding April on the heels of the Act of Uniformity to which Cheney was summoned in vain. It required the signing of the 39 articles and enacted under Archbishop Grindle's leadership many things equally hateful to Cheney, such as displacement and defacement of altar stones. A great symbol this, and no mere act of pillage. The abolition of prayers for the dead, the prohibition even of the sign of the cross in church. Cheney, excommunicated for his willful absence, afterwards sued by proxy for absolution, for the sake of averting temporal penalties, but he had nothing more to do with the hierarchy. Now you have declared war against your colleagues, shows that Campion had heard accurate news of all this. The moment may have seemed to Campion exactly favourable for such a strong appeal. One of Cheney's successors in his see declared, it was certain he died a papist. This was contradicted by a lesser authority, but yet a good one. If it were indeed certain, at least Edmund Campion, to whom the tidings would have been most consoling, never knew of it. It seems as if Cheney could not have answered that bugle call of a letter. He is said, however, to have kept it always, and to have called it his greatest treasure. How these many cries of the heat of my love must have haunted his ear. It is hardly in human nature to value such a document at all, and there are passages in it more ruthless, after the manner of the time, than any we have quoted unless for the reflex reason that it does its intended work in the heart of the receiver. To have valued it either as a piece of literary cleverness or as a monument of misdirected concern would have been equally cynical and clean contrary to Cheney's known attitude towards his friend. He did not live to see Campion return to England, shunning the bigots and the unprincipled men in power to the last, and sheltering the Catholics all he could, he shut himself up at Gloucester, a whole high church party in himself, wounded and at bay. And there, in 1579, he died, and was buried in the glorious cathedral without an epitaph. The dream of his lifetime, as well as Edmund Campion's sonship, he had loved and lost. End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of Blessed Edmund Campion。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christopher Oram. Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Imogen Gaini The Call to Come Up Higher Douay, Prague, 1571-1573 In Allen's Apology for Seminarians, there is a beautiful account of the ideals of Douay. Quote, the first thought of the founders of the college had been to attract the young English exiles who were living in Flanders from their solitary and self-guided study to a more exact method and to collegiate obedience, and their next to provide for the rising generation in England a succession of learned Catholics, especially of clergy, to take the place of those removed by old age, imprisonment, and persecution. 
Their design, then, was to draw together out of England the best wits from the following classes. Those inclined to Catholicism, those who desired a more exact education than could be obtained at Oxford or Cambridge, where no art, holy or profane, was thoroughly studied, and some not touched at all, those who were scrupulous about taking the oath of the Queen's supremacy, those who disliked to be forced, as they were in some colleges of the English universities, to enter the ministry, and those who were doubtful which religion was the true one, and were disgusted that they were forced into one without being allowed opportunity of inquiring into the other." End quote. The spirit of Douay was not reactionary, but the best spirit of the English Renaissance. It had, besides, a character or atmosphere holy and bright, not formed by mere human culture. It was as a garden enclosed and a fountain sealed. Campion found there a peace such as he had never known. He had already, at Oxford, given seven years to philosophy, and six more to Aristotle, positive theology, and the fathers. The study of scholastic theology was dead in Oxford. Campion now first took up the teachings of St. Thomas Aquinas. He arrived in June, and in August he bought a noble edition of the Summa for his own use, in three volumes folio. This was discovered in 1887 by Canon Didio of Lille, and is now at the Roehampton Novitiate. Several features make it a particularly interesting relic. Campion's signature, with the date of his purchase on the flyleaf, various beautifully executed little drawings, underlinings, and a host of marginal notes in Latin. By far the most touching of these relates to what St. Thomas quotes from Gennadius on the baptism of blood. Blessed Edmund Campion wrote in a tall, bold hand, over against the passage, the one using word, martyrdom. Canon Didio, with that intimate touch of French sympathy, calls it mot redu et prophétique. For nearly two years, Campion followed the course of scholastic theology, taking his degree of bachelor in January 1573. He then received minor orders and was ordained a subdeacon. All went happily for him at Douai. He was again at his old work, and, as ever, he won the highest opinions from those among whom he moved. In his Oxford days, he had always held lofty standards before his pupils. Quote, Never to deliquous into sloth, nor to dance away your time, nor to live for rioting and pleasure, but to give yourselves up to virtue and learning, and to reckon this the one great, glorious, and royal road. End quote. But the feeling in the exhortations of his later life is tenfold deeper, and strikes a far more haunting note of duty toward England and toward the Church. This is a passage from the revised De Juvene Academico, which had first been sketched out years before in Dublin. Quote, Listen to our Heavenly Father, asking back his talents with usury. Behold, by the wickedness of the wicked, the house of God is devoted to flames and to destruction. Numberless souls are being deceived, are being shaken, are being lost, any one of which is worth more than the empire of the whole world. Sleep not while the enemy watches, play not while he devours his prey, sink not into idleness and folly while his fangs are wet with your brother's blood. It is not wealth, nor liberty, nor station, but the eternal inheritance of each of us, the very lifeblood of our souls, our spirits, and our lives that suffers. See, then, my dearest young scholars and friends, that we lose none of this precious time, but carry hence a plentiful and rich crop, enough to supply the public want, and to gain for ourselves the reward of dutiful sons." End quote. One of those who listened to these words was destined to become the pro-martyr of the English continental seminarians, Gutbert Mein, a dear pupil of Campion's, who, as a Devon lad, had come up to Oxford and St. John's, had first conformed to the new regulations and served as college chaplain, then awakened from his delusion and fled overseas for conscience' sake, not to escape danger, but to be prepared for it, in response to one of Campion's burning letters. This letter was intercepted, but its purport had reached him and decided him. In the spring of 1573, Campion found himself driven to a course he had not contemplated on coming to Douai. As he slowly saw his way, he followed it, to horizon beyond horizon. 
he had many steps to take because in his thirst for perfection he had far to travel. He told Dr. Allen he wished to leave his present life, go on pilgrimage in the spirit of penance to the tomb of the apostles at Rome, and there seek admission into the society of Jesus. The medieval orders would have less attraction for Campion. He was an intensely modern man. Now this was a severe blow to Allen, hardly less so to others of Campion's circle. Campion, the pride, the example, the hope of the seminary, to quit it for good, and to quit it in order to join the most recent of religious communities, one which as yet had few English members. It was inexplicable. But Allen, like the great-hearted and broad-minded commander-in-chief he was, let him go without protest. He little foresaw that far from losing his most promising champion, he was but lending him to better masters of the interior life than himself, and would receive his trained strength again in the English mission's spiritual day of battle. Campion set out on foot across the continent for Rome, along that road trodden by many a Saxon king and English saint to the Apostles' Shrine. His companions walked with him all the first day, but the next morning he sent them back and pushed on alone. Solitude was henceforth his choice whenever duty permitted. He must have had many strange adventures during that spring journey. We know of one of them, though not from him. At some point of the route, probably on the northern Italian border, he came face to face with an old friend, an Oxonian and a Protestant. The horseman first rode past the poor mendicant on the highway, and then was prompted by some dim sense of recognition to return and speak to him. On realizing that it was really Edmund Campion whom he used to know, in great pomp of prosperity, he showed much concern, proffered his goodwill and his purse, and begged to hear how Campion had fallen into that ill plight. But the pilgrim refused aid, and the other traveler heard something then and there of the, quote, contempt of this world and the eminent dignity of serving Christ in poverty, end quote, which greatly moved him. And us also, adds Robert Parsons of Balliol, that remained yet in Oxford when the report came to our ears. A strange tale it must have seemed to those who knew their master of arts and all of his old fastidiousness. He was by now a saint in the making, and they were fast losing touch with him. Personal holiness is, so to speak, a mining country. Its progress and its wealth are underground, unguessed at by the careless passerby. A saint is a mystery because he walks so closely in the shadow of God, who is the great mystery. When Campion reached Rome and had paid his devotions to the holy places, he went to call upon Cardinal Gesualdi, who, as he stated afterwards, Quote, having some liking of me would have been the means to prefer me, but I, resolved what course to take, answered that I meant not to serve any man, but to enter into the society of Jesus, thereof to vow and to be professed. End quote. With this intention, Campion sought out the newly elected head of that society, Father Edward of Liege, whose surname was generally Latinized into Mercurianus from Mercia, his native village. He was fourth in his office, having succeeded that great personality, St. Francis Borgia, on St. George's Day, April 23, 1573. Biographers have represented that Campion had half years to lay in Rome before he was able to apply for admission to the society, but such was not the case. He promptly presented himself and was received as Mercia's first recruit, and received not as a postulant, but as a novice. As Anthony Wood tells us, quote, he was esteemed by the general of that order to be a person every way complete, end quote. Four years later, Campion most affectionately thanked his own old tutor, John Bavand, for unasked introductions, help, and money, which had been supplied since he came to Rome. He speaks of himself as one whom you never knew could repay you, but who was at the point, so to speak, of death. You were munificent to me when I was going to enter the sepulchral rest of religion. The aid he would not accept for himself on his journey from one friend he had accepted in the city, and spent, no doubt, in almsgiving from another. Perhaps Bavand was abroad, and heard of that incident which came to pass on the road, 
Certainly, he was one from whom Campion could not in chivalry refuse whatever he chose to share with him. The Society of Jesus had been founded only six years before Campion was born. It had as yet no English province, that is, no members living under the English flag with a domestic government of their own. But Edmund Campion was already well known to the provincials on the continent, who had a warm contest over him, every one of them wishing to add such a promising soldier to his own wing of the army of the Lord. As it fell out, Bohemia won. Campion was sent as one of a company to Vienna, and then from Vienna to Prague, where the novitiate was with Father Avila Nendo, confessor to the Empress, a man of wide experience. He was so deeply edified by his companion that, he told Father Parsons long after, it had kept him all his life much affectioned toward England and Englishmen. Prague was in a miserable, godless state. The Catholics were poor and few. The great university had perished. And all this was due to the ruin, moral and material, produced by the preaching, at the dawn of the 15th century, of Jan Hus. That Hus got his socialistic ideas from Wycliffe was a fact never out of Campion's mind while in Bohemia for he thought that England owed some reparation to a country which she had helped to spoil, and he was more than willing to pay his part of that debt. End of chapter 5. Recording by Christopher Oram. Chapter 6 of Blessed Edmund Campion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Paula Messina Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Emogen Guiney Chapter 6 The Wished-For Dawn, Bohemia, 1573-1579 Campion stayed but two months at Prague. As the small novitiate was removed to Brune in Moravia, where the inhabitants were most hostile to Catholicism, the Bishop of Olmutz begged the Jesuits to help him so far as their rule permitted. Novices were sent out among the neighboring villages to catechize and instruct the poorer Catholics, and no one had so instant a success in this little enterprise as God's Englishman. At the year's end, his novice master, John Paul Campanus, became rector of the college in Prague, and took Edmund Campion back with him. The latter left a good deal of his heart within the grey and austere walls of Brune, as two of his charming letters show. In the old garden, under a mulberry tree, he had had a wonderful vision. Our Lady stood there, smiling at him, and offering him a purple robe. He knew the portent of martyrdom, but for long hid it in his heart. At Prague, Campion continued and increased his due employments. He opened the October term with what was called a glorious peroration. As professor of rhetoric, he wrote in 1574 a beautiful little treatise on that subject so familiar to him. His duty was to be first in the house to rise and last to go to bed. He spent his recreation time catechizing children, receiving converts, visiting the prison and the hospital, or helping the cook in the kitchen. In January 1575, he set up at his college a branch confraternity of the Immaculate Conception, or Sodality of Our Lady, of which he became president. About the same time, he made his first vows. He was continually called upon for great college occasions and to pronounce public panegyrics. Whatever had to be done, says his pompous but sympathetic biographer, Bombino, was laid upon him. On getting a fresh task, he would ask his superior, in a spirit of perfect humility and confidence, if he was thought strong enough to add that to the rest, and if the answer were yes, he shouldered the new duty at once, much to the wonder of others. I am in a continual bloom of health, he writes gallantly to his dearest Parsons, who had just entered the society. 
I have no time whatever to be ill in. Two sacred plays, six hours did it take to perform each of them, came from Campion's truly dramatic pen in 1577. One was on the sacrifice of Abraham, one on the melancholy career of King Saul. It is a matter of much regret that these are lost. He seems also to have composed dialogues and scenes for his own scholars, and to have put together at the same time his spirited account of the origin of the English schism, in a narrative, in Latin, of the divorce of King Henry the Eighth from his wife and from the church. It was printed by Harpsfield, long after Campion's death. Meanwhile, Rudolf the Second had succeeded to the imperial throne, and the magnificently provided envoy who was sent to Prague, bearing the congratulations of Queen Elizabeth, was none other than Sir Philip Sidney. Sidney's mind was set upon seeing his old friend Campion, and talking with him. But he managed only with difficulty to carry out his wishes. He went officially in the Emperor's train to hear his friend, not yet in priest's orders, preach, and on his return to England, unguardedly spoke with delight of the sermon whenever sidney visited the continent he was supposed to become tainted with a hankering after catholicism though in all his public actions he was conspicuously protestant campion who knew him from boyhood and was not given to misjudgment believed that he had almost won over the star of english chivalry this young man so wonderfully beloved and admired he calls him in 1576, a testimony doubly interesting when we remember that Philip Sidney was then but three and twenty, to the effect which his short life made upon all his contemporaries. He had much conversation with me, Campion's letter goes on, and I hope not in vain, for to all appearances he was most keen about it. I commend him to your remembrances at Mass, since he asked the prayers of all good men, and at the same time put into my hands alms to be distributed to the poor for him. This trust I have discharged. He ends by hoping that some of the missionaries then going back to England from Douay will have opportunity of watering this plant. Poor, wavering soul. Father Parsons, in his life of Campion, tells us that Sidney professed himself convinced but said that it was necessary for him to hold on the course which he had hitherto followed. Such was the sad answer of Felix to St. Paul. Campion's thoughts had turned often of late to another friend, Gregory Martin, who had left overcrowded Douay for the seminary newly founded in the heart of Rome, in the ancient English hospice for pilgrims. Campion longed to turn his fellow priest into a Jesuit, for he loved his own society in the extreme, but that was not to be. A letter to Martin, glowing with that interior fire which was shut out from Edmund Campion upon everything he touched, ends most tenderly. Since for so many years we too had in common our college, our meals, our studies, our friends, and our enemies, let us, for the rest of our lives, make a more close and binding union, that we may have the fruit of our friendship in heaven. For there also I will, if I can, sit at your feet. After years filled with literary and academic labor in two colleges, and blessed with marked growth and holiness, Edmund Campion was ordained priest by the Archbishop of Prague. His first Mass was said on the Feast of the Nativity of Our Lady. September 8, 1578. Following his general's express command, he dismissed the old unhappy scruple about his Oxford deaconate, and it troubled him no more. He was made professor of philosophy. You are to know, he pleasantly says, that I am foolishly held to be an accomplished sophist. During the course of this year, 1578, he wrote his last and most famous drama, now lost, on St. Ambrose and the Emperor Theodosius, which, when acted, made a tremendous stir. 
he became ever more and more noted as a preacher, a sower of eternity, in the popular heart, as well as the favorite orator when grandees died and were buried in state. But all this time his mind and heart were far away. No one ever practiced religious obedience in a more heroic spirit, yet he secretly longed to throw his life and his labors directly into the balance for England's sake. He knew what was going on there, and his thoughts seemed never once to have turned towards the pikes or any political remedy. His whole ambition was, as he said in one letter, to torture our envious foe with good deeds, and in another, to catch them by the prayers and tears at which they laugh. His long dear Cuthbert Maine, of whom he had lost sight for a while, had given up his life for the faith at Launston, November 29, 1577. He had been captured near Probus. His wealthy host, Francis Trejan, was attained of Premunire, and his children completely beggared. This young West countryman had a character all his own. He had been charged with nothing but the exercise of his priestly functions, and was offered his life on the day of his execution if he would but swear that the Queen was supreme head of the Church of England. Upon this, continues the Chronicle, he took the Bible into his hands, made the sign of the cross upon it, kissed it, and said, The Queen neither ever was, nor is, nor ever shall be, the head of the Church of England. Campion had only recently heard the news in the August of 1579. One can read between the lines of a passage like this. We all thank you much for your account of Cuthbert's martyrdom. It gave many of us a divine pleasure. Wretch that I am, how far has that novice distanced me? May he be favorable to his old friend and tutor. Now shall I boast of these titles more than ever before. Within the next six months, Edmund Campion was to see the beginning of his heart's desire. Dr. Allen, the founder of Douay, was in Rome to organize the English college, and there he brought all his persuasion to bear upon the general of the Society of Jesus and his consulters that the English Jesuits might be allowed to join the English secular priests in the pressing redemption of their distracted country. There were the gravest reasons for and against the proposal. But the answer given to Dr. Allen was that the society would do its best to supply missioners thenceforward, and that Robert Parsons and Edmund Campion should be sent first as forerunners of the rest. Allen was naturally overjoyed. While Mercure, the Father General, wrote officially to Campion's superior at Prague, Allen wrote a moving letter to Campion himself. My father, brother, son, he calls him, make all haste and come, my dearest Campion, from Prague to Rome, and thence to our own England. God, in whose hands are the issues, has at last granted that our own Campion, with his extraordinary gifts of wisdom and grace, shall be restored to us. Prepare yourself, then, for a journey, for a work, for a trial. The imaginations of Campion's comrades at Prague were touched to the quick by the prospect opening before their happy brother. One of these bore witness to the fragrance of his own thoughts by painting a garland of roses and lilies on the wall of Campion's little room, just at the bed's head. A white-haired Silesian, Father James Gall, wrote in scroll fashion by night over the outer door of that same little room, Parter Edmundus Campionus, Martyr. For such a romantic irregularity, the old saint was reprimanded. He replied quite simply, but I had to do it. Poor Campion, who was shy, had seen both these things, before Campanus, the sympathetic rector, gave him his marching orders to start at once for Rome. The fathers do verily seem to suspect something about me. I hope their suspicions may come true, he said. God's will be done, 
not mine. And then adds that first English biographer who so well knew him and so much loved him. Being scarce able to hold tears for joy and tenderness of heart, he went to his chamber, and there upon his knees, to God, satisfied his appetite of weeping and thanksgiving, and offered himself to his divine disposition without any exception or restraint, whether it were to rack, cross-quartering, or any other torment or death whatsoever. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Blessed Edmund Campion This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria de Fatima da Silva. Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Imogen Guinea. A Long March. Rome, Geneva, Reims, 1580. From Prague to Munich and from Munich to Innsbruck, Campion had the distinguished and very friendly company of Ferdinand, brother of the reigning Duke of Bavaria. Afterwards, he went on alone on foot, as he was always glad to do, as far as Padua. Here he took horse for Rome, which he reached just before Palm Sunday, April the 5th, 1580, coming in grave priest's garb, we are told, with long hair after the fashion of Germany. He was informed by the Father General that he was to start for England nine or ten days after Easter. Campion begged neither to be superior of the expedition nor to have anything to do with the preparations, and that during the fortnight he might be free from all except necessary cares in order to make a more devotional entrance upon the life ahead of him. And the like did, for their part, and had done all the Lent before. Those are the priests also of the English seminary, says Parsons, speaking of many seculars afterwards martyred, that were appointed by their superiors to go with us in this mission. All these together used such notable and extraordinary diligence for preparing themselves well in the sight of God, as was matter of edification to all Rome. Rome was a most religious place at that time, not only in its enduring associations, but in the temper of the people. One, in large measure, responsible for its spirit of penance and prayer and loving charity to the poor, was then living at San Girolamo, opposite the old English hospital, now turned into a college. This was St. Philip Neri, the most venerated and enduring figure in all the great city. He knew the successive little English bands. When he passed them in the streets, cheerful St. Philip used to smile tenderly and give what must have been to them a thrilling greeting. Hail, little flowers of martyrdom, the opening line of the breviary hymn for Holy Innocent's Day. Parsons and Campion and the secular clerics associated with them may have originated the custom of going over to San Girolamo for a special fatherly blessing before setting forth to almost certain death. There is a tradition, mentioned by Newman, that one of that company did not care to seek St. Philip's prayers, and that afterwards he failed to persevere. This is thought to be the lay student, John Paschal, or Pascal, who was apparently of an unstable disposition, and is known to have forsworn the faith when his great chance came to profess it. The Pope Gregory XIII showed untiring and fatherly interest in all the missionaries, and their traveling funds were his personal gift. He wept over them in bestowing his parting benediction. Campion set out this time with seven English priests, Ralph Sherwin, a former fellow of Exeter College among them, also with two lay brothers and two students. Others joined them from Hans and Louvain, some of them advanced in years and well known. The party adopted the novel and almost daredevil fashion of going on foot but mounted and riding privately in advance of it were its two eldest members. One was the holy 
octogenarian Thomas Goldwell, the Lord Bishop of St. Asaph, who had been offered by Queen Mary a transfer to the See of Oxford and refused it. He was destined to be the last survivor of the deposed and scattered Catholic hierarchy in England, who had all but one refused the unheard of oath in 1559 and had all been deprived of their sees that same year. Bishop Goldwell now, 20 years afterwards, was one of two who were living, and his colleague Watson, Bishop of Lincoln, was in prison. The other senior missionary was his companion, Dr. Nicholas Morton, canon penitentiary of St. Peter's, who had done something already towards the making of English history. The first little Jesuit group of three was commanded by Father Robert Parsons, a born organizer, a man of splendid resources, afterwards celebrated and much loved and hated. For convenience as for safety, they all put on secular dress. Campion, however, would buy no new clothes, but arrayed himself in an old buckram suit with a shabby cloak. When rallied on his highly inelegant appearance, he remarked with a gay spirit so like that of another, blissful martyr, Sir Thomas More, that a man going forth to be hanged need trouble himself little about the fashion. The roads were bad beyond any modern idea of badness, and it poured rain for the first nine or ten days. Campion, the least robust of the party and the most poorly clad, fell ill under such combined discomforts, and while crossing the Apennines had to be lifted into the saddle of one of the very few horses which had been brought along for the sake of the infirm. As soon as he was well enough, he resumed his daily habit of saying Mass very early, and of walking on in the later morning hours, till he was a mile ahead of the rest, to make his meditation, read his office, and say the litany of the saints, before he should be overtaken. He and his comrades planned their spiritual life day by day with the most careful regularity. Their talk was always of souls. The harvest was their word for England, or else the warfare. In the chilly spring twilights, Campion would push on ahead again to make his prayers alone and utter his zealous affections to his saviour without being heard or noted. The route lay through Siena, Florence, Bologna. In the latter city there was a week's delay due to an injury to Father Parson's leg. The band of twelve was entertained by the Cardinal Archbishop of that see, who was the historian of the Council of Trent, Gabriel Paliotto. Like Avulanedo, like many another Italian, Paliotto loved the English. Were he a born Englishman, he could not love them more, wrote Agazario to Alan, at that time when the national temperament was much more expressive and responsive than it is now. At Milan, in the early part of May, the future confessors and martyrs were to find another and a greater, also much affectioned towards them, who received them most hospitably, and even asked the English college for other relays of guests in the future. This was the great Archbishop St. Charles Borromeo. Bishop Goldwell, who had passed through Milan days before the walkers reached it, had been in 1563 Vicar General to St. Charles and would have bespoken his interest in the little party. The Reverend Host complimented Ralph Sherwin by asking him to deliver a sermon before him, and as for Campion, he was required to discourse daily after dinner. St. Charles himself, all the while, whether vocal or silent, was acting upon the pilgrims as a susum corda. Without saying a word, he preached to us sufficiently, says the ever appreciative Parsons, and so we departed from him, greatly edified and exceedingly animated. How charming is the forgotten use of the last word, meaning sold, or as we still say, heartened, inspirited. Such indeed is the true function of the saints. From Turin, the little company made for Mount Senus, 
and young, middle-aged and old, lustily climbed it. And then among the torrents and boulders of that glorious scenery, they came down into Savoy. At St. Jean Morienne, they found the roads blocked by the Spanish soldiery, and at Aiguebel ran across other disturbances caused by the wars of religion raging in the Dauphine. As there was nothing to do but abandon the direct route, they turned aside and entered Geneva, the hotbed of Calvinism and the home of Theodore Beza, the learned apostate who had succeeded to Calvin's leadership. There was a close community of spirit between Geneva and the English Reformation. However, Switzerland, then as now, had liberal laws, and any traveller, Catholic or Protestant, was free to pass, and molested, though not unquestioned, three days in the city. It looks decidedly like an alloy of mischief on the part of five of the English that they went to call in a body on Beza. They were admitted as far as the court by Claudine, his stolen wife, whom they had all heard of, and were not ill-pleased to see. When the famous grey beard came out, they managed, after passing their compliments, to worry him with some telling, controversial shots. Campion knew not how to be rude, but Showin found amusement ever afterwards in remembering how that honest fellow, Patrick, stood and looked and talked cap in hand, facing out. Such is Showin's shockingly boyish language in a private letter. The old doting heretical fool. The celebrity so described behaved rather vaguely, and in the course of nature, could not have been sorry to see the last of his besiegers and of their wits sharpened with life in the open air. He bowed them out with less abruptness than might have been expected, indeed with a certain show of civility, and went back to his books. Later showing and two other youngsters in a midnight discussion with some English Protestant students actually challenged Beza and all Calvindom to a trial of theologies, with a drastic proviso that the defeated party should be burnt in the marketplace. Meanwhile, Campion, in the role of Patrick, did his share of facing out other worthies in Geneva, besides finding an old university friend there, who used him lovingly, but reported that an alarm had been raised and encouraged the departure of the paladins. These, halting on a spur of the Jura before nightfall, with Lake Lemon spread beneath them, said Te Deum together that they were safely out of the city. There seems to have been a good deal of curiosity or bravado mingled with their polemical zeal, and Campion's always tender conscience would have readily accepted, if it did not suggest a suitable penance for the raid. So off they trudged nine steep, contrite extra miles, Extreme troublesome, we are told they were, to the nearest shrine, that of St. Claude, over the French border. They entered Hans the last day of May, 1580, for in Hans was the soul, if not the body, of the college now driven, partly for convenience, partly by force of trouble, out of Douay. That college was never reformed, but the scholar exiles lived close together, up and down the street still called Rue des Anglais. The travellers were rapturously welcomed by all, especially by the great Englishman, whom the old narrative quaintly calls Mr. Dr. Allen, the President. Here at Reims, the venerable Bishop of St. Asaph fell ill of a fever. He was never again to cross the channel. By the time he had fairly recovered, rumours of his movements had naturally got abroad, and the Pope was unwilling to imperil so important and precious a person. While still a convalescent at Reims, Goldwell wrote to His Holiness in person, begging him to listen to no objections, but to anoint at once three or four new bishops to shepherd their own needy church. And he very touchingly assures the Holy Father, knowing that the question of a fitting maintenance for them would arise, that God had so inclined the minds of all the English priests whom he knew to put up with their penniless and hunted daily lives, and the vision of the gallows always before them, that any of these 
once consecrated, would be entirely contented to go on as poorly as he had gone heretofore, like a bishop of the early church. The application failed. Etiquette and routine prevailed, says Simpson, in summing up this incident. In truth, it was not that goodwill was lacking. Nobody on the Catholic side believed that the new sad order of things in England was going to last, and consequently, waiting and postponing in a matter of this sort could not seem the disastrous mistake which it really was. The upshot, in any case, was that the good bishop was recalled to Rome, and there died, and that for thirty weary years the poor flock struggled on without any qualified prelate to supply their crying spiritual wants and hold them together. Then the first provisional leader, known as the archpriest, was appointed, and later came vicars apostolic. When finally the longed-for mitres were seen again in the land, they had been absent too long. The nominal link snapped. The great native tradition was broken. The titles of the ancient seas given up as if in sleep by their lineal heirs were never reclaimed. So far as surface connection goes, and it goes far indeed with people in general, who neither reason nor read, but get all their ideas from what they see and hear, this was the most tragic loss which could possibly have befallen the post-Reformation Church. The English Benedictines kept the thread of their own dynasty in their hands, but this did not affect the Catholic body and the lay interest. The stranger who could not destroy the life and blessing of the firstborn has had possession for three centuries and a half by royal grant of his home and of his very name. End of chapter 7「8 of Blessed Edmund Campion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Imogen Guinea. In this pitable home, 1580. Sir Francis Walsingham had a wonderfully well-organized spy system, far superior, as Simpson remarks, to the attempts of the Spaniards in the same line. Therefore each of the missionaries was cautioned to travel under a name other than his own. Campion fell back upon his beloved alias of Mr. Patrick, as he had done for the brief visit to Geneva. His friends made him drop it as they neared the channel, being Irish, it was doubly dangerous, since here at Reims the homegoers got their first tardy news of the so-called Geraldine insurrection in Ireland, acted upon in July 1579, and crushed almost as soon by the massacre at Sermwick in Kerry. It had been nursed by European feelings against Elizabeth's policy in Flanders, and her piracies on the high seas and the great religious grudge found it a convenient opening. Dr. Nicholas Sander, who was not a papal legate, but stood none the less for the Pope's act of goodwill in the matter, joined the expedition with James Fitzmorris, Spanish soldiers, Roman officers, ships, and supplies. That expedition did not, as we know, dislodge Jezebel from her throne, but it gave sufficient heartbreak to our messengers of the gospel of peace who were now sure to be mixed up with it in the popular mind the situation was certainly an awkward one it gave unique plausibility to walsingham's claim that to quote father poland the preaching of the old faith was only a political propaganda father robert parsons faced the future on behalf of the rest in the spirit of a brave man seeing that it lay not in our hands to remedy the matter our consciences being clear we resolved ourselves with the apostle through evil report and good report to go forward only with the spiritual action we had in hand and if god had appointed that 
any of us should suffer in england under a wrong title as himself did under the case of a malefactor we should lose nothing thereby but rather gain with him who knew the truth and whom only in this enterprise we desired to please danger was a spur and not a bridle to campion's devoted will but he began to foresee little fruit from labors on his native ground with so much fierce misunderstanding against him and to fear that he had not done well in so gladly laying down what was after all steady and successful work in bohemia with this buzzing scruple he went to the president for advice allen replied that the work in bohemland excellent at all points as it had been yet could be done by an equally qualified person or at least by two or three such persons whereas in his own necessitous england campion would be given strength and grace to supply for many men at rheims during his waiting time campion preached one of his famous sermons to the students it gave him a pathetic pleasure to be complimented upon his ready english of which he had spoken little in private and not a word in public for eight years his text is reported to have been luke twelve forty nine i am come to send fire upon the earth and what will i but that it shall be kindled and at one point he cried out in so earnest a manner fire 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 that those outside the chapel ran for the water buckets but a careful reading of what was then spoken suggests quite a different passage of holy scripture as present in campion's mind his theme was the ruin wrought by the conflagration of heresy now attacking a third generation of christian souls and to be put out he says by water of catholic doctrine milk of sweet and holy conversation blood of potent martyrdom isaiah sixty four eleven runs our holy and our beautiful house where our fathers praise thee is burned up with fire and all our pleasant things are laid waste this very passage had been alluded to in one of campion's former exhortations and may have been a favorite with him the whole trend indeed and every part of this reams sermon bear out the thoughts not of the apostles page but of the prophets bishop goldwell and dr morton the highest in office of the missionary party remained at reams three englishmen a lay professor of law and two priests joined in to fill up the gap then another jesuit who had been laboring in poland this was father thomas cottam ordered home to restore his health but destined as were so many of his comrades for martyrdom the little band of fifteen divided and sailed from different ports campion with parsons and one lay brother ralph emerson headed for calais as their point of departure going by way of st omer's not a little encouraged to think that the first mission of st augustine and his fellows into our island was by that city here there was another jesuit college the flemish fathers croaked friendly warnings in their ears for it was common rumor in st omer's that the queen's council had full information of the appearance dress and movements of the exiles and had officers posted to waylay them on arrival they had come on foot nearly nine hundred miles and were not likely to give up the object of their journey but they took precautions it was decided that parsons should go first in military attire accompanied from the low countries by a good youth who passed as his man george and that if parsons got safely to dover he was to send for campion and the faithful little soul ralph emerson an english gentleman living overseas for his conscience brought father parsons his fine disguise nothing less than a captain's uniform of buff leather with gold lace big boots sword hat plume and all campion when he had gone sat down to write to the general of the society about him with his inevitably pictorial touch father robert sailed from calais after midnight they got him up like a soldier such a peacock such a swaggerer such duds 
such a glance such a strut a man must have a sharp eye indeed he adds to catch any glimpse of the holiness and modesty that lurks there underneath it all he goes on to explain how he is laying out money to buy numerous and silly clothes to dress up myself and ralph whereby to cheat the madness of this world father parsons like campion himself in lesser roles must have been a dramatic genius for arriving at dover on the twelfth of june and falling into the hands of the searcher he so won him over by the mere swagger and strut aforementioned as not only to be passed without inquiry but to be helped to a horse to carry him to gravesend thereupon the captain was quick to bespeak the interest of so unexpectedly polite a functionary in his friend mr edmonds described as a jewel merchant lying at st omer's and he gave the searcher a letter recommending london as a good market to be forwarded post haste to that gentleman and to be shown to the searcher again by mr edmonds himself when he came over and by the reception of that letter campion learned that father parsons was scot-free and speeded on his way on the feast of his old college patron st john the baptist mr edmonds followed by brother ralph his supposed servant boarded the vessel bound for dover at daybreak they stepped ashore under the white cliffs and there kneeling a moment in the shadow of a rock campion renewed his offering of himself without reserve or condition to the god of hosts for the dark warfare which lay before him meanwhile the dispositions of the searcher who evidently put in no appearance had undergone a forced change he and the mayor of the town had been reprimanded by the council for letting papists slip through their nets moreover there had been furnished by a spy a detailed description of cardinal allen's brother who was about to pass through dover on his way to relatives in lancashire and as gabriel allen and edmund campion looked very much alike our jewel merchant found himself instantly under arrest with an accuracy which he was not in the least aware of the mayor charged him and the lay brother of being foes to the queen's religion and friends to the old faith with sailing under false names and with returning for the purpose of propagating popery campion offered to swear that he was not gabriel allen but offered in vain the mayor had a hasty conference and ordered a mounted guard to carry both prisoners up to st francis walsingham and the council all this time campion was praying to god for deliverance and earnestly begging st john the baptist to intercede for him and his companion they were waiting near the closed door of a room suddenly wrote campion himself long after to the father general suddenly cometh forth an old man god give him grace for his pains well quoth he it is agreed you shall be dismissed fare ye well after which the two jesuits left without further notice or opposition and travelled as fast as ever they could to london father parsons had reached the city not without adventure but without mishap a fortnight before yet as no word had been received since from him campion had no idea how to proceed or whither to go nor could he inquire without arousing suspicion fortunately parsons had given to some watchful young catholics a description of the jewel merchant and his man ralph emerson was easily recognizable on account of his extremely short stature thus they had hardly touched the wharf at the height before a stranger thomas j stepped to the gangway with a welcoming gesture saying mr edmonds give me your hand i stay here for you to lead you to your friends under this guidance campion reached london and chancery lane where he was clothed and armed and provided with a horse he must have been astonished to learn under whose roof he was so safe and so comfortable for it was none other than that of the chief pursuivant here was indeed a case of the bird nesting in the cannon's mouth st augustine warns us that we are not to think that ungodly men are kept in this world for nothing 
nor that god has no good purpose of his own to fill through them one cause of the miraculous preservation of the ancient faith under elizabeth lay in the fact that many an official high and low of that time serving government was in the pay of the recusant gentry a strange situation it was and by no means an infrequent one when some of these brought before the magistrates would be discharged on the assurance of the bought-over official that the prisoner was an honest gentleman thus averting all suspicion from the latter for the time being the band of lay catholics some of whom campion had known from boyhood like henry vaux and richard stanahurst were acting as friends freely leagued together as occasion arose for the helping of priests and the furthering of religion their time their thoughts their self-sacrifice their purses were at the service particularly of the jesuits persons habitually being described by st walter mildmay in the star chamber as lewd runagates a sort of hypocrites a rabble of vagrant friars the leader of them all and his inspiring zeal though not highest in station was george gilbert a rich young squire owning estates which were confiscated in the end in buckinghamshire and suffolk he was a convert a great rider and athlete dear to many but in secret a lover of apostolic poverty living for others in short a saint he spent himself to the last breath for the faith as truly as if he had perished at tyburn tree in banishment he still served the same cause by his forethought and generosity and the use of such worldly goods as were left to him for he became responsible at rome for the series of paintings of the english martyrdoms which gave their chief historical standing to the beatifications of eighteen eighty six thus gilbert living and dead was blessed edmund campion's availing friend and lover End of chapter 8chapter nine of blessed edmund campion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england blessed edmund campion by louise imogen guinney chapter nine skirmishing the english counties fifteen eighty the devoted george gilbert his fellowship of young men and those whom they gathered together met on the feast of st peter and paul june twenty ninth to hear for the first time father campion preach it was no easy task to find a safe and suitable auditorium but lord paget one of their own number was daring enough to hire from lord norris the hall of a great house in the neighbourhood of smithfield all the servants and porters were turned out for the occasion and gentlemen took their places within a few days however rumours about campion's sermon and about campion were flying over the city there were a number of spies about instructed by the council pretending to be lapsed catholics or unsettled protestants and trying hard to bag such new and shining birds as the jesuits but campion had a friend at court who warned him and therefore held only private conferences in friendly houses with those whom he knew the missionaries were sent to strengthen the wills of the wavering catholics and not primarily to make converts personal dealings with would-be converts were never attempted except as supplementary to the action of the lay helpers who took all the soundings and gave any needful catechizing when parsons who had been away in the country got back to town mr henry orton and father robert johnson had been tracked and imprisoned through sled the apostate informer and it became plain to the rest of the little band gathered about parsons and campion that for reasons immediate and remote both fathers must be spirited away each went mounted with a companion gervase pierre point being campion's guide and at hoxton in july the priests parted for their separate fields of action just before that however 
there arrived as a deputy to them mr thomas pound of belmont the best known perhaps of all the english prisoners for the faith he was committed to jail sixteen times and passed thirty years in durance pound had managed to bribe the jailer of the marshalsea to let him out for this short journey most anxious for the good repute of the fathers he rode post haste to tell them that enemies in london were spreading the report that they had come over the political purposes and that if in the midst of their apostolic work in the shires they should be taken and executed the government would be sure to issue pamphlets as was its habit defaming their motives and slandering the catholic body therefore he begged both jesuits to write a vindication of their presence and purpose in england which signed and sealed might be given to the public if things came to the worst the certain accusation and its answer had been debated before in council by many clergy who had contented themselves with agreeing to swear when called upon that they had no business whatever in hand but that of religion but campion now drew up his own document then and there at a table while the others were talking in it he declares that my charge is of free cost to preach the gospel to cry alarm spiritual that matters of state are things which appertain not to my vocation and are straitly forbid things from which i do gladly estrange and sequester my thoughts and never thinking of himself but fired with confidence in his cause he goes on to beg leave for a public presentment of the faith he says in the course of this splendid little philippic i should be loath to speak anything that might sound of an insolent brag or challenge in this noble realm my dear country it shows completely the partisan temper of the time that is his statement got exactly that name and no other fastened upon it it was called everywhere campion's brag and challenge and its modest author was contemned and ridiculed for the implication that his own powers were so very superior that he must of course get the better of others in any argument pound took his copy which campion forgot to seal back to london read it in raptures let it be seen admired talked about and transcribed this was his curious way of keeping a secret the result was that what was meant to meet a particular crisis and serve for a lost will and testament became as common property beforehand as any ballad sold in the streets lively measures were at once taken by the bishop of winchester and the state hypocritically urging conspiracy pounced upon a host of catholic lords and gentlemen yet campion's little composition which bred all this fury only asked for three sorts of indifferent and quiet audience one hearing before the lords in council on the relation of the church to the english government the next before the head of houses of both universities on the proofs of the truth of the catholic religion the last before the court spiritual and temporal wherein i will justify the said faith by the common wisdom of the law's standing then he pleads indifferent and almost affectionate words for a special audience of her noble grace the queen in his candour and fearless simplicity he believed that opponents had only to hear to be convinced thus crediting them with that earnestness in religious matters which he possessed himself and which only a very few of the best protestants of that day shared with him campion closes his appeal with a wonderfully beautiful reference to the vowed seminarian priests and in a lofty music of good english worthy to stand by any passage of like length in the great prose classics hearken to those which spend the best blood in their bodies for your salvation many innocent hands are lifted up unto heaven for you daily and hourly by those english students whose posterity shall not die which beyond the seas gathering virtue and sufficient knowledge for the purpose are determined never to give you over but either to win you to heaven or to die upon your pikes and touching our society 
be it known unto you that we have made a league all the jesuits in the world whose succession and multitude must overreach all the practices of england cheerfully to carry the cross that you shall lay upon us and never to despair your recovery while we have a man left to enjoy your tyburn or to be racked with your torments or to be consumed with your prisons the expense is reckoned the enterprise is begun it is of god it cannot be withstood so the faith was planted so it must be restored if these my offers be refused and my endeavours can take no place and i having run thousands of miles to do you good shall be rewarded with rigour i have no more to say but recommend your case and mine to almighty god the searcher of hearts who send us of his grace and set us at accord before the day of payment to the intent we may at last be friends in heaven where all injuries shall be forgotten parsons work lay in gloucester hereford worcestershire warwickshire and derbyshire campions in the more southerly midlands the wandering levite with his attendant gentleman would approach at evening and with caution the friendly roof either catholic or though protestant containing catholics and be received at the door as strangers then conducting it to an inner room where all who seek the priest's ministrations kneel and ask for his blessing that night all is got ready and confessions are heard instructions given reconciliations effected at dawn there is mass preaching and holy communion and the travellers depart for the next household station most edifying accounts are given of the devotion of good married confessors who were scattered all over the land the jesuits men met with many seculars whom we find in every place whereby both the people is well served and we much eased in our charge these were the old marian priests active in obscurity the harvest is wonderful great so many show a conscience pure a courage invincible zeal incredible a work so worthy the number innumerable of high degree of mean calling of every age and sex the solaces that are ever intermingled with the miseries are so great that they do not only countervail the fear of what punishment temporals soever but by infinite sweetness make all worldly pains be they never so great seem nothing for the sake of this good people which had lived before so many ages in one only faith day by day running in and out of all the busy heroic toil is the fiery thread of danger and alarm we are sitting merrily at table conversing familiarly on matters of faith and devotion for our talk is generally of such things when comes a hurried knock at the door we all start and listen like deer when they hear the huntsman if it is nothing we laugh at our fright then there was calumny a far more difficult thing to accept in the same gay spirit they tear and sting us with their venomous tongues calling us seditious hypocrites yea heretics too which is much laughed at the people hereupon is ours and again the house where i am is sad no other talk but of the death flight prison or spoil of their friends nevertheless they proceed with courage very many even at this present being restored to the church new soldiers give in their names while the old offer up their blood by which holy hosts and oblations god will be pleased and we shall no question by him overcome these are extracts from campion's letters and give a clear idea of his life during his visitations of fifteen eighty to fifteen eighty one there were then many more manor-houses kept up as such than there are now most of those which campion visited had their hiding-place or priests holes to which he could always fly when safety demanded it he settled a host of weak catholics in their religion and also received a great many conspicuous converts it will be noted that the little jesuit mission was directed to the gentry this was not through accident or partiality or snobbery the gentry had most personal weight they were better able to protect a hunted man and they were naturally supposed to have stricter notions of honour 
this last was a point on which everything depended moreover the old spirit of feudalism was not so dead but that through them all workmen on their estates or connected by interest with them in the towns could be reached and influenced in a hurried campaign every consideration of prudence and forethought would choose them so to speak as the outworks of the citadel the country districts north and south were all still favourable to catholicism london the university of cambridge and some larger towns and seaports especially in the west were half puritan or calvinistic half irreligious and indifferent the ancient faith as was well said by sir cuthbert sharp for the most part still lay like lees at the bottom of men's hearts and if the vessel were ever so little stirred came to the top a thoughtful living writer sums it up as his conclusion that england would have resumed the faith with a sigh of relief had it not been for the resentment spread by the catholic plotters considering the frightful circumstances of the body to which these men belonged it is putting too great a strain perhaps upon human nature to expect smooth behaviour from every individual in it the genuine plotters were few against them stands the passionate loyalty of a persecuted minority both all along and in the one great crisis when the deliverer loomed up in the shape of the philip's armada blessed and indulgenced like a crusade of old where were they supposed to be so sick of queen and country hand in impoverished pocket strengthening the national defences cutlass on thigh manning the english fleet End of chapter nine chapter ten of blessed edmund campion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by elaine conway england blessed edmund campion by louise imogen guinney chapter ten many labours and a book fifteen eighty campion passed four months of pleasant weather in hard and happy work moving about northamptonshire berkshire oxfordshire some lovely little spiritual adventure starred his path and the paths of others wherever he went he must have seen more than once from some hilly road afar off even if he never entered it the towery city branchy between towers which was so dear to him to the last in october of this year fifteen eighty he was bidden towards london as far as uxbridge farther he could hardly come without the gravest peril as the privy council were just issuing their third warrant for the capture of jesuits there he was joined by father parsons and several other missionaries a conference was held it was represented that norfolk and lancashire were eager to claim father campion's ministrations and it was decided that he was to go to lancashire preferable as being not only farther from london and also more affected to the catholic religion but as having better private libraries for they were now urging campion to write again this time something on the burning questions of the day aimed particularly at the universities where his challenge was still the staple of daily talk and therefore to be written in latin we are not so sure nowadays that controversy does much good but one reason for that may be that we have few campions to carry it on it is well to remember that people then read nothing else except poetry campion's work was his famous decem rationes proposite in causa fidei or as the title is given in its only modern translation eighteen twenty seven ten reasons for renouncing the protestant and embracing the catholic religion at first the author was for calling his thesis heresy and despair de heresy desperata his counsellors agreed amid laughter that it would be odd indeed to nail such a title as that to the mast 
when heresy was so wonderful and flourishing but according to campion's own philosophy there was no life in an argument whose only premises as he once said are curses starvation and the rack here we come back at once to his root principle which modern research so fully justifies in regard to the england of his own day a gentleman saint who uttered many an ironic but never a contemptuous word campion could not be persuaded that the received religion was a genuine thing he believed that temporal interest alone led people to conform to the new alterations and restrictions that the lay statesmen who were pushing things through were concerned not with doctrine but only with negations of doctrine and that on the other side nothing was so promising nothing so gloriously fruitful as persecutions and martyrdoms first and to last he had a strong dash of optimism in this spirit he began his last treatise writing it as best he could depending on his memory and on such books as country squires might have in their houses and putting it together in among the almost incessant journeys duties fatigues and alarms of the next few weeks the two jesuit friends parted at axbridge with a tenderness of heart which in such a case and so dangerous a time may be imagined gervase pierpont conveyed campion into nottinghamshire to spend christmas at thoresby his home thence into derbyshire where one of the young tempests succeeded as guide and the gentleman who directed the yorkshire part of the journey reached in safety the house of his own brother-in-law mr william harrington of mount st john near thirsk where the father was received with open arms here he settled down for less than a fortnight at his desk among his notebooks at peace but to have him in the house at all was to risk the contagion of the things of god the eldest of the large family a wild boy his father's namesake was quick to feel the spell of this most attractive guest not only his eloquence and fire says father henry moore of campion but a certain hidden infused power made his words strike home some of these simple words of every day struck home to the young william harrington so that fourteen years afterwards he found the palm branch of martyrdom growing green and fair for him on the public execution ground at this very time of campion's visit the lent of fifteen eighty one there was another lad of fourteen or fifteen john pibbush running about the streets of thirsk his native village who may have gone to confession to the strange priest at the manor and wondered at him and knowing that he too was sealed as a future holocaust in the same immortal cause from mount st john where he must have tasted much natural happiness campion travelled into lancashire under the protection of a former pupil and his wife there he was affectionately welcomed and cared for in each of eight great houses where himself and his spiritual conferences were still a glowing tradition sixty or seventy years afterwards he had to live think right in a crowd the local gentry drove from great distances and slept in barns only to hear and see him once at blaine's cough hall the seat of the worthingtons the pursuivants would have discovered them where he was walking in the open air had it not been for the cleverness and splendid presence of mind of a faithful maid-servant standing hard by she ran up against him in a pretended fit of temper and shoved him into a shallow pond the pursuivants sent out by the terrible huntington president of the north to apprehend a distinguished cleric and scholar naturally never gave that mud-covered yokel a second glance father campion would have learned by now the fate of most of the enthusiastic band who had travelled in his company from rome or rheims to england during the preceding summer five priests including the lovable gay-hearted sherwin were languishing in cells and on the rack father parsons though hunted was free following a suggestion of campion's he set up a private printing press in order that the ten reasons and other catholic works of defensive controversy might be issued as they were needed 
publishing like every other major industry open to the catholics was outlawed devotional and doctrinal books had to be brought out in this whole and corner fashion if at all another of those lay associates of the mission whose devotion and usefulness had been proved at every point came forward to bear the brunt of the new enterprise the young stephen brinkley bachelor of civil law called by parsons a gentleman of high attainments both in literature and in virtue volunteered to become manager and head compositor and amid many dramatic and exciting interruptions carried his task through machinery types paper and the rest were bought with money supplied by the ever helpful george gilbert brinkley himself to avert suspicion had to buy horses for his workmen and to tire them like persons of quality whenever they went abroad he quite knew what he was risking after him still another knight of letters in a far less perilous field offered himself in the person of thomas fitzherbert of swineton then newly married long afterwards a priest and rector of the english college in rome his not undelightful duty was to verify the mass of references and authorities quoted in the margins of campion's manuscript this he did in a scholarly way satisfactory to the scholarly author who believed in research and liked nothing at second hand lastly parsons as campion's superior recalled him to london in april or may to see the little volume through the press and cautioned him to put up only at inns on the way where happily he might pass as the gentleman in the parlour thirty miles or so north of the great city campion had one of his ever-recurring narrow escapes a spy hungry for reward had dogged his steps on his way from york at a certain town not named a little boy who knew campion by sight overheard this man describing the father to a magistrate and calling him jesuit a word the child had never heard he ran straight to the tavern where the jesuit had put up and succeeded in finding him and warning him so the bird was safely on the wing before the fowlers were in sight campion came to westminster and whitefriars and set to work diligently as ever with father robert he had frequent occasion to visit the bellamies of uxenden hall near harrow a family under whose roof his old friend richard bristow had died in the preceding autumn their later adversities and annihilation were only too typical of catholic domestic history under elizabeth going to harrow meant going up the edgeway road and in the mouth of that road between wastelands facing the spot across the street where the marble arch now stands was the famous tyburn gallows this particular one had been put up new for dr story's execution ten years before it had three posts set in a triangle with connecting crossbars at the top once every week without intermission batches of criminals perished there even now and with far greater frequency afterwards holy and innocent men and women made up a large proportion of the criminals and remembering these dear souls and conscious that there was to follow them in confession of the king of martyrs campion would always solemnly take off his hat and pause in passing to salute tyburn tree meanwhile in the quiet and seclusion of dame cecily stoner's park near henley and in the attics which he bravely set apart for the purpose the decem rationes got itself safely printed by stephen brinkley and his seven honest men campion with fine bravado dated it from cosmopolis and the distribution of it was as audacious as the dating the first copies bound about four hundred in number were hurriedly stabbed instead of stitched in time to go up for oxford commemoration june twenty seventh of that year the church of st mary the virgin was then used for all the acts the accommodation of which a century later the sheldonian theatre was built when the company entered st mary's the benches were found littered with the seditious books their dedication was to the studious collegians flourishing at oxford and cambridge and the youths in question were just in the humour to read them and read to them they did then and there instead of attending to the important annual function going on this rudeness bred protest and protest bred a lively scene to understand it we must recall that the undergraduate element 
was then by comparison the conservative element heads of houses fellows and tutors learned and popular men had been removed wholesale by the elizabethan settlement of religion in favour of new men concisely described as extremists from geneva intellectually inferior to those who had been displaced and representing a different spirit and different traditions the student body looked on them with scorn again to quote another chief authority on this subject the young oxonians did not bear easily the elizabethan drill and felt that if their liberty must be crushed they would fain have it crushed by something more venerable than the mushroom authority of the ministers of the queen they were as tinder and campion's book was just the sort of spark to set them in a blaze the excited government told off relays of clergymen to court-martial and shoot it aylmer bishop of london wished to commission nine deans seven archdeacons and two regius professors of divinity to punish the tiny offender but the actual ammunition brought into the field was not quite so imposing as all this the answers were duly published dealing in the most unmeasured personal abuse of campion no attempt was made in any instance to rival either his religious fervour or his literary grace his last labour with his pen made in short a very great and an extremely prolonged stir its fate was a romantic one from start to finish for it was so quickly and thoroughly confiscated that not more than a couple of copies are now known to exist spite the outcry or because of it edition after edition was called for there have been nearly thirty reprints in the original latin and many translations into modern languages inclusive of three beautiful translations into the good english common in sixteen o six sixteen thirty two and sixteen eighty seven one of which should be reissued the ten reasons written under such immense difficulties had all of campion seal and pith and was a model of eloquence elegance and good taste mark antony muret the greatest latinist of the time called it libellum aureum a golden little book writ by the very finger of god campion had gone in his ardent sensitive rhetorical compendious way over the whole ground of the credentials of that church which had had the allegiance of england for more than a thousand years scripture the fathers the councils the evidence of human history are all drawn upon in the best spirit of the new learning the characteristic note of personal appeal to the queen is not lacking here at the end campion's theme is the church and he quotes from the prophet isaiah kings shall be thy nursing fathers and queens thy nursing mothers and he names as among the great monarchs his joy it was to further the church in their day saint edward the confessor saint louis of france saint henry of saxony saint wenceslas of bohemia saint stephen of hungary and the rest then he cries out to elizabeth most mighty queen to listen for this prophet is speaking unto thee is teaching thee thy duty i tell thee one heaven cannot gather in calvin and these thine ancestors join thyself therefore to them else shalt thou stand unworthy of that name of thine thy genius thy learning thy fame before all men and thy fortunes to this end do i conspire and will conspire against thee whatever betideth me who am so often menaced with the gallows as a conspirator hostile to thy life all hail thou good cross the day shall come o elizabeth the day that shall make it altogether clear which of the two did love thee best the company of jesus or the brood of luther hardly was the last of the original imprints bound and distributed when the pursuivants in search of what was roughly but significantly enough called massing stuff pounced upon stoner park and caught red-handed there and carried off the two gentlemen john stoner and stephen brinkley and four of the printers one of whom a poor frightened fellow conformed and was let off at once william hartley ordained the year before who had in person strewn the ten reasons over the benches of the university church and made special gifts of copies in various colleges was arrested a little later his fate was not exceptional like that of his comrades just mentioned who were eventually released on bail he suffered at tyburn 
and his mother heroic as the mother of the maccabees stood by his young body in its butchering and thanked god aloud for her privilege in so giving back to him such a son campion spent st john's day marking the first anniversary of his return to england at lady babington's at twyford in buckinghamshire a house not many miles from stoner on the other bank of the thames he stayed a little while at bledlow also and at winge with the dormers his whole heart bent every moment of the time upon his father's business but his three days were almost done the outcry redoubled now that he had again succeeded in catching public attention fresh and monstrously cruel measures were therefore taken against all papists naught is lacking wrote to aquaviva the tender soul who too well knew himself to be the cause of many sorrows but that to our books written with ink should succeed others daily published and written in blood father parsons prudently ordered him back to the north the two heard each other's confessions and renewal of vows at stoner and said good-bye exchanging hats as a parting gift after the friendly fashion of their time campion was to ride straightway into lancashire to get his manuscript and notes left behind his former companion ralph emerson going with him and he was then to betake himself to the fresh mission field in norfolk as it fell out he soon spurred back after parsons to tell him of a letter that moment received it was from a gentleman named yate then a prisoner for his religion earnestly begging campion to visit life at grange in berkshire the gentleman's own estate hard by where his wife and mother still were together with edward yate and part of a proscribed community of english rickettee nuns driven back into england by troubles in the low countries father parsons knowing the house to be a conspicuous one and already supplied with chaplains was unwilling to grant the permission but eventually he gave in warning the two others not to tarry beyond one night or one day and as a precaution putting campion under the lay brother's care and obedience parsons parted from him not without a rueful and affectionate word you are too easy going by far he said to his friend and fellow-soldier purposely giving its least heroic name to that intentionally prodigal zeal for souls i know you father edmund if they once get you there you will never break away end of chapter ten chapter eleven of blessed edmund campion this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org Recording by Paula Messina Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Emogen Guiney Chapter 11 At Lyford Grange and After, 1581 On the morning of July 12, Father Edmund and Brother Ralph, faithful to agreement, were in their saddles again, leaving the pious household refreshed but lamenting. Of the two priests who formed part of it, one father collington or colleton escorted them some distance on their way campion had already been waylaid at an inn near oxford by many friendly tutors and undergraduates when up galloped the other chaplain of lyford father ford he was a trinity college man who had entered douay just after campion's arrival there and was to follow him closely to martyrdom ford brought news that a large party of Catholics had come over to Lyford to visit the nuns, and distressed at missing Father Campion, were clamoring for his return. The Oxford group had been begging their old champion to preach to them, which he would not do in so public a place. They now added their entreaties to those of the deputy of the strangers, and offered to join these at Lyford. Surely he who had given a whole day to a few godly nuns, who needed him but little, could not refuse a Saturday and Sunday to so many soiled souls of every stripe and color, thirsting for the waters of life. The suit was insistent. Campion was inclined to give in, but referred his admirers to Brother Emerson, 
as his provisional superior. He, in turn, was overborne. It seemed much safer, after all, for the precious father to be among friends, while he, Ralph, went on alone to fetch the books from Mr. Richard Houghton's in Lancashire. So back to Lyford Campion went, to the poor little lay brother's everlasting regret. On the following Sunday morning, the ninth after Pentecost, Campion preached at the Grange on the Gospel of the Day, the peculiarly touching gospel of Jesus weeping over Jerusalem, the changed and faithless city which stoned the prophets, and knew not in her day the things that were to her peace. No one present ever forgot that heart-shaking sermon, laden as it was with pathos and presentiment. There was an audience of sixty, including the Oxonians. Unfortunately, it included also George Eliot, a man of the most evil personal repute, an apostate, and a government spy armed with plenary powers. He was then under a charge of murder, and was anxious to whitewash himself in the eyes of the council by some conspicuous public service. He had once been a servant of the Ropers at Canterbury, and Mrs. Yates' honest cook, who had known Elliot there in his decent days, let him in without question, whispering what a treat was in store for him in the preaching of none other than Father Campion. Though the warrant for the apprehension of the Jesuit was in Elliot's pocket, he little thought to capture him so easily and so soon. A perservant had accompanied him to the gate. Elliot went back to this person, nominally to dismiss him, as a heretic, really to speed him to a magistrate at Abingdon, for a force of an hundred men to arrest Campion in the Queen's name. Then he went piously upstairs to Mass. Edmund Campion's last Mass, so far as we know, that and the sermon passed by in peace, and Eliot himself left. Immediately after dinner, an alarm was given by a watchman posted in a turret, who saw the enemy far off. Campion sprang up and started to leave at once, and alone, saying that his chances of escape might be fair, and that his remaining would only involve the household in discomfort and danger. But they all clung to him, assuring him that Lyford was full of cunning secret passages and hiding holes, and into one of these, in the wall above the gateway, he was forthwith hurried by Ford and Collington who laid themselves down by his side and crossed their hands over their breasts. Back came Elliot with the magistrate, a civil squire, and the neighborly Berkshire yeoman who loathed the work. He made them turn the whole house topsy-turvy, nor desist till evenfall. Then, finding nothing, they withdrew. However, they returned almost in the same breath, egged on by Elliot, who now would have the walls sounded. The Abingdon magistrate apologized to Mrs. Yates, not for the Queen's warrant, but for his associate, the madman, as he called him, who was carrying it out. The lady was an invalid. Thinking not altogether of herself, she railed and wept. The magistrate kindly soothed her fears and allowed her to sleep where she pleased, undisturbed by his men and their din. She chose to have a bed made up close to the hiding place. She was conducted thither with the honors of war, and a sentinel was posted at the room door. The tapping and smashing went merrily on elsewhere until late at night, when, by her orders, the sheriff's baffled underlings made a fine supper, and, being worn out, fell asleep over their cups even as they were expected to do. Poor Mrs. Yate was either by nature the silliest of women, or else her nerves were upset by illness and trying circumstances, for she sent for Father Campion, as well as for all her other guests who were in that part of the house, and requested him, as he stood by her bedside, of all possible things, to preach to them just once more. 
one could not in courtesy refuse a hostess however unreasonable who was risking so much for him nor would it have been like him to refuse allen tells us that it was his invariable habit to preach once a day at the least often twice and sometimes thrice whereby through god's goodness he converted sundry in most shires of this realm of most wisdom and worship besides young gentlemen students and others of all sorts father campion discharged his task as the little congregation broke up someone stumbled in the dark and several fell the snoring sentinel awoke searchers with lanterns and axes swarmed up from below there was nothing to be seen lyford was not honeycombed in vain with hidden passages the men-at-arms had been fooled too often and were angry with elliot yet that functionary knew that something was still really afoot that the alarm was not a false one on going down the stairs again he struck his hand upon the wall over it we have not broken through here he said a loyal servant of the yates who was at his side and who knew it was just there the refugees lay muttered that enough wall had been ruined already and then went deadly pale while elliot's eye was still on him the latter called in triumph for smith's hammer and banged it into the thin timber partition and into the narrow cell and thus was father edmund campion taken at lyford grange at dawn of monday july seventeenth in the year fifteen eighty one he was quite calm quite cheerful with him were apprehended the two priests seven gentlemen and two yeomen forster the sheriff of berkshire hitherto absent arrived as he was an oxonian and almost a catholic and kindly disposed towards campion he waited to hear from the council what was to be done on the fourth day orders came to send the chief prisoners up to london under a strong guard leaving the old moated house and its many occupants now distracted with grief campion took horse at the door and rode slowly off elliot prancing in triumph at the head of the company though the common people saluted him as judas all along the way the first halt was at abingdon sympathetic oxford scholars had come down to see the last of the great light of the university under such black eclipse elliot accosted his victim at table mr campion i know well you are wroth with me for this work he drew out a beautiful answer sincere composed half playful a saint's answer nay i forgive thee and in token thereof i drink to thee yea and if thou wilt repent and come to confession i will absolve thee but large penance thou must have at henley campion saw in the crowd father parson's servant and greeted him as he could without betraying him father parson's was near at hand but was wisely kept indoors a young priest mr philby the younger as he was called a native of oxford is said to have here attempted to speak to campion he was at once seized upon as a traitorous comforter of jesuits and added to the cavalcade at colebrook less than a dozen miles from london came fresh instructions from the council sheriff forster had treated his prisoners most honorably they were now to be made a public show their elbows were tied from behind their wrists roped together in front and their feet fastened under the horses their leader was decorated with a paper pinned to his hat father parson's hat of late on which in large lettering was inscribed campion the seditious jesuit and in this guise he was paraded through the chief streets of the great city on market day the mob roared with delight but the wiser sort says hollinshed lamented to see the land fall into such barbarism as to abuse in this manner a gentleman famous throughout europe 
for his scholarship and his innocency of life, and this before any trial, or any proof against him, his case being prejudged, and he punished as if already condemned. Stephen Brinkley somehow obtained, as a souvenir of a fellow prisoner, that thick dark felt hat, which had been so ignominiously labelled in the cause of Christ. Years afterwards, when in Belgium, he put it into a reliquary, out of love and veneration towards that most holy martyr of God, his father and patron. A piece of it is at Roehampton, in the Jesuit novitiate. On reaching the tower, the Lyford captives were given up to the governor, Sir Owen Hopton. Taking his cue, he had Campion thrust at once into little ease. The famous tower hole, not high enough for a man to stand upright in, nor long enough for him to lie down in. After four days of this misery, he was suddenly taken out, put in a boat at the trader's gate steps, and rowed to the town house of the Earl of Leicester. This nobleman and Edmund Campion, who had seen so much of each other for several years, had been placed by events in silent conflict. There stood the Earl of Bedford, with two secretaries of state. There stood Campion's host, who for one reason or another had never haunted Catholics with the fixed fury of Wallingsham and Burghley, and thereby did not displease his irresolute royal mistress. There, a theatrical circumstance, was that royal mistress herself, a gleaming, stately vision in a great chair, head and front of a not unfriendly little inquisition. To the questions heaped upon him, Campion gave frank answers. On the matter of allegiance, he seemed to satisfy the company, who told him there was no fault in him save that he was a papist. That, he modestly interrupted, is my greatest glory. The queen smiled upon him and offered him liberty and honors, but under conditions which his conscience forbade him to accept. When he was courteously dismissed, Lester, probably with a kind motive, sent a message to Hopton to keep up the flatteries of the new policy. Hopton put on an almost affectionate consideration for his important prisoner, and so fast as he was prompted by artful degrees, he suggested to him a pension, a high place at court, and even the promise eventually of the mitre and revenues of the primatial see of Canterbury. Well did the council know, all along, the value of these stubborn and unpurchasable confessors of Christ. To cap the matter, in Campion's case, it was publicly announced, both by Hopton and by Wallingsham, who knew the untruth of their announcement, that the Jesuit was at the point of recantation in Protestant orthodoxy, and in full sight of the future Archbishop Rick, to the great content of the Queen. It flew all over London that he would presently preach at Paul's cross, and there burn the Dicem Rationes with his own hand. Eventually, Hopton returned to first principles indoors, and inquired point-blank of Campion whether he would give up his religion and conform. The reply is easily imagined. A continued course of wheedling was wasteful business. So thought the council, and three days after his strange and sudden sight of the Queen's Grace at Leicester House, Edmund Campion, first kneeling down at the door, and invoking the holy name for steadying of his manhood, was stripped and fastened to the rollers of the tower rack. Blandishments had failed to move him. They would try mortal pain and see what that could do. Torture, nevertheless, was as much against the laws of England then, though not against the laws of some less humane countries, as it is now. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Blessed Edmund Campion. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elaine Conway, England. Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Imogen Gwynney. 
Chapter Twelve: The Thick of the Fray, 1581. Campion, in between the working of the rollers, was asked his opinion of certain political utterances in the works of his old friends Allen and Bristow, and of Dr. Sander, also whether he considered the Queen true and lawful, or pretensed and deprived. He refused to answer. Physical anguish could be little worse than the ineffable boredom of these two never quiet questions. He was then asked by the governor, the rackmaster, and others present, by whose command and counsel he had returned to England, by whom in England he had been received and befriended, in whose houses he had said mass, heard confessions, and reconciled persons to his church where his recent book was printed and to whom copies were given lastly what was his opinion of the bull of pius v against queen elizabeth a letter written at the time to items in the above category houses were searched persons of mark were apprehended tried in the star chamber and sentenced almost every manse or town house where campion had been harboured became known and even the names of those oxford masters of arts who had followed him to lyford the government gave out that he had confessed upon the rack and implicated his two trusting friends the alleged facts naturally became a general scandal and bred grief and horror among the catholics who no less than protestants were thus driven to believe them the secrets were probably given up under panic by three serving men and by poor gervais pierre point it was a common trick of the time though not peculiar to it to show a prisoner a lying list of names purporting to have been extracted from colleagues so that he himself might be trapped into endorsing the suspicions held in regard to those names but it is clear that campion was brought to mention only a few who as he was aware were formerly known to his examiners as catholic recusants and only after a solemn oath from the commissioners that no harm could accrue to them in consequence of such supplementary mention even this he had every cause to regret the gentlemen and gentlewomen on lord burleigh's lists were carefully informed when arrested that it was campion who had betrayed them a cruel slander which he could refute only at the foot of the scaffold thanks to the reports first of his backsliding then of his treachery his great reputation for the time being was clean gone having thus been given forth to the public as a knave he was now to be set before them as a fool and shown to be one who possessed neither sort of superiority moral or mental many courtiers having a purely artistic interest in edmund campion had begged that he might obtain the chance he had often asked for of being heard in a disputation this request was now suddenly granted the conference was public and came off of the norman chapel of the tower which was crowded two deans noel of st paul's and day of windsor were appointed to attack campion he was to answer all objections as he could but was forbidden to raise any of his own clark the bitter puritan preacher of gray's inn and whitaker the regius professor of divinity in cambridge were the notaries the line to be baited did not even know that there was to be a conference until he was brought to it under a strong guard time for preparation had been denied him platforms and their tables spread with books of reference pens and paper one who was there tells us how easy and ready were his answers how modest his mien how that high-spirited nature so bore the scorn the abuse and the jests heaped upon him as to win great admiration from the majority of those who heard him for the first time he began by asking very pertinently whether this was a just answer to his challenge first to rack him then to deprive him of books notes and pen lastly to call upon him to debate and he added wishing to be fully understood by the audience that 
what he had asked for was quite another sort of hearing a hearing under equal conditions before the universities during the course of this first conference he was twice most unfairly tripped up once over a quotation in which he was right though he could not then and there prove it and again over a page of the greek testament in such small type that he could not read it and had to put it by when it was handed to him thereby drawing down upon himself the ridiculous taunt that he knew no greek this he took silently and with a smile at the end of the six hours he had more than stood his ground the deans complained afterwards that a number of gentlemen present neither unlearned nor ill-affected considered that master campion had the best of it some common people who thought so too and said so in the streets paid dearly for their boldness one of these gentlemen favourably impressed was philip earl of arundel then in the flush of worldly pride and pleasure he was the real victory of the jesuit apostle for he received at that time and in that place the first ray of divine grace strong enough to change gradually in him the whole motive and course of that intensity of life which never failed the howards as he stood leaning forward in the foreground of the day in that solemn interior tall and young with his great ruff and embroidered doublet and his brilliant dark eyes held by the pathetic figure of master campion how little could he have foreseen his own weary term of suffering in that gloomy fortress and his sainted death there at the end of the years there were three other conferences under like conditions but in other quarters with four fresh adversaries campion was again appointed only to answer never to oppose that is to answer miscellaneous and disjointed objections against the catholic church without ever being allowed to build up any harmonious apology for his own system the last conference was notable for its browbeating and threatening of a too successful adversary the bishop of london privately came to the conclusion that the verbal tournament was doing no good whatever to the sacred cause of protestantism the council agreed and ended it towards the end of october campion was racked for the third time and with the utmost severity so that he thought they meant this time to kill him but his fortitude was unshaken a rough and honest first cousin to the queen henry carey lord hunsdon growled that it were easier to pluck the heart out of campion's breast than to wrest from him one word against his conscience his arms and legs went quite numb after this final torture the keeper who was won over by his endearing prisoner and was always as gentle with him as he dared to be inquired next day how they felt not ill said father edmund with all of his old brave brightness not ill because not at all never once until now had he been accused of any conspiracy but he was a troublesome person he must be silenced somehow with a tardy inspiration the council bent all their strength to get out of campion some acknowledgment that he had been mixed up with the spanish roman expedition and the irish rising of the preceding year not a shadow of proof could of course be produced for such a charge then as a final and sure means of indicting him on some other count than that of religion and of urging his execution upon the queen walsingham with burleigh's connivance hatched a treasonable plot out of his own inventive head and got false witnesses to accuse edmund campion of it and swear his life away the plot of rhymes and rome was described as an attempt to raise a sedition and dethrone and to kill the queen it had an imaginary but recent date fifteen eighty everybody or anybody when found convenient could be accused of so elastic a plot it was first charged against some twenty priests and laymen in this year fifteen eighty one but it was brought up against 
the earl of arundel four years afterwards despite the fact that the supposed interests of the church were the last things likely to win his attention at the time assigned on all saints day arrived in england a suitor for the hand of queen elizabeth francis duke of alencon king of the netherlands the short-lived heir to the throne of king henry the third of france with that king while duke of anjou and with alencon for nine years past as for three yet to come elizabeth had carried on negotiations which ended in smoke but she now announced that she would marry at last little froggy as she endearingly called him was ugly to a degree and many years younger than her majesty he was brother-in-law to the queen of scots who was her majesty's prisoner at sheffield the dominant ultra bigoted party took extreme alarm at the near prospect of toleration for catholics which such a royal match suggested to them to reassure them it might just now be most useful thought the council to hang a jesuit or two on the fourteenth of the month campion and eight others were arraigned before the grand jury in westminster hall for treasonable intents of the queen's deprivation and murder these secret and privy practices of sinister devices befitting one led astray by the devil had edmund campion clark made his re-entry into england the pope meanwhile being not only aware of his act but its author and onsetter he was commanded as were all those lumped with him in a common accusation to plead guilty or not guilty up went all the right arms of those devotaries and dead men to this world who travelled only for souls as campion himself called them all but his so disabled by the rack that he could not stir it from the furred cuff in which it lay but a quick-witted comrade turned and took off the cuff humbly kissing the sacred hand so wrung for the confession of christ and lifted it high to cry its own mute not guilty with the rest the spanish ambassador don bernardino de mendoza standing close by with his secretary saw with a pang of pity that all the finger-nails were gone from campion's swollen hands the trial proper began on the twentieth before such a presence of people of the more honourable wise learned and best sort as was never seen or heard of in that court in ours or our father's memories before us so wonderful an expectation there was to see the end of this marvellous tragedy of such as they knew in conscience to be innocent they all heard ralph sherwin say in a loud clear voice the plain ground of our standing here is religion and not treason chief justice ray presided a catholic at heart and wretched ever after over this unwilling day's work the prosecuting officers for the crown were the queen's sergeant edmund anderson popham afterwards chief justice and egerton afterwards the first lord ellesmere the chief witnesses were george elliot anthony mundy and he creatures named sled and caddy probably as evil a quartet as existed in contemporary england and worthy forerunners of oats and bedlow they had nothing left to swear as campion reminded the jury neither religion nor honesty in no special order but with much ardour and diligence all the old tiresome trivial accusations brought forward and pressed in campion being spokesman throughout for the defence and his alert mind despite his weakened body meeting them all and rooting them he was charged with having seduced the queen's subjects from their allegiance and reconciled them to the pope he caught up the word we reconcile them to the pope nay then what reconciliation can there be to him since reconciliation is only due to god this word reconcile soundeth not to a lawyer's usage and therefore is rested against us inaptly the reconciliation that we endeavoured was only to god as peter saith 
reconciliamini domino be ye consoled unto the lord campion was informed yourself came as procurator from the pope and dr allen to break these matters to the english papists so he rejoined that in his homeward voyage from rome and to take him by his vow of obedience as a jesuit the which accordingly i enterprised being commanded thereto he had dined with dr allen at rheims with whom also after dinner i walked in his garden and not one jot of our talk glanced to the crown or state of england as to the pope he flatly with charge and commandment excused me from matters of state and regiment followed a change of tactics after claps make those excuses but shadows for what meaning had that changing of your name whereto belonged your disguising in apparel what pleasure had you to hoist it in a velvet hat and a feather a buff leather jerkin and a velvet venetians can that be seen a professed man of religion which hardly becometh a layman of gravity no there was a further matter intended had you come hither for love of your country you would never have wrought a hagamugger had your intent been to have done well never have hated the light to which campion replied that saint paul in order that living he might benefit the church more than dying betook himself to sundry shifts but that especially the changing of his name was very oft and familiar and that he sometimes thought it expedient to be hidden lest being discovered persecution should ensue thereby and the gospel be greatly forestalled if these shifts were then approved in paul why are they now reproved in me he an apostle i a jesuit the same cause common to us both i wished earnestly the planting of the gospel i knew a contrary religion professed i saw if i were known i should be apprehended i changed my name i kept secretly i imitated paul was i therein a traitor the wearing of a buff jerkin a velvet hat and such like is much forced against me i am not indicted upon the statute of apparel indeed i acknowledge an offence to godwards for so doing and thereof it doth grievously repent me and i therefore do now penance as you see me this charming rejoinder again how more like was in allusion to his rough gown of irish frieze and a huge black nightcap covering half of his newly shaven face after all this mere hectoring some pieces of evidence were produced one of these was an intercepted letter which campion himself had written from the tower after his first and comparatively moderate racking while it was still possible to use his hands it was addressed to the admirable and truly holy but fussy mr thomas pound who wild with alarm at the pretended betrayals had written to remonstrate with father campion the queen's council now read this passage from campion's humble reply it grieveth me much to have offended the catholic cause so highly as to confess the names of some gentlemen and friends in whose houses i had been entertained yet in this i greatly cherish and comfort myself that i never discovered any secrets there declared that i will not come rack come rope the comment of the reader in court was an obvious one what can sound more suspiciously or nearer unto treason than this letter it must needs be some grievous matter and very pernicious that neither rack nor rope can wring from him but campion's even more obvious answer was that there he spoke as one by profession and calling a priest vowed to silence in regard to what was made known in the confessional and yet pressed on the rack to divulge secrets thus communicated to him these were the hidden matters in concealing of which i so greatly rejoiced to the revealing whereof i cannot nor will not be brought come rack come rope well chosen was this answer of campion's it has been pointed out that if he had stated here that he had told on no one who was not already found out he would have loosed the informers and manhunters afresh on the whole catholic community until his other friends who had not been found out were run down instead of that he drew off attention by reminding the court that he could not repeat what had been sacramentally confided to him most of his hearers were either catholic or had been catholic and acquiesced he spoke truth 
but he skipped explanations and such is more often than not the highest wisdom in this complex world there were now read out certain papers containing oaths to be administered to persons ready to renounce their obedience to her majesty and to be sworn of the papal allegiance alone these were said to have been found in houses where campion had lurked and for religion been entertained hence they were of his composing he objected that the administering of oaths was repugnant to him and exceeded his authority neither would i commit an offence so thwart to my profession for all the substance and treasure in the world he went on to say assuming for his purpose that the precious papers were not forged though they really were so that there was no proof of their connection with himself nor was it even pretended that they were in his handwriting and his son replied with singular perversity or dumbness you professed papist coming to a house and then such reliques found after your departure how can it otherwise be implied but that you did both bring them and leave them there so it is flat they came there by means of a papist ergo by your means the logician in campion dashed to the fore could it be shown that no other papist ever visited that house but himself if not they were urging a conclusion before framing a minor which is imperfect he added and proves nothing apparently sergeant anderson was sufficiently enraged by now his highly judicial retort is on record if here as you do in schools you bring in your minor and conclusion you will prove yourself but a fool but minor or conclusion i will bring it to purpose and on elliot then rose as witness and gave his account of the sunday sermon at lyford her master campion spoke of enormities in england and of a day of change soon coming welcome to the shaken and dispersed catholics but dreadful to the heretical masters of the land what day should that be broke in the queen's council but that wherein the pope the king of spain and the duke of florence have appointed to invade this realm campion turned his eyes on elliot oh judas judas as in all other christian commonwealths so in england many vices and iniquities do abound whereupon as in every pulpit every protestant doth i pronounced a great day not wherein any temporal potentate should minister but wherein the terrible judge should reveal all men's consciences and try every man any other day than this god he knows i meant not so much for the astonishing evidence of this most astonishing of all trials one only under pontius pilate excepted the chief count against the defendant was the old one of the bull of deposition and the denied authority of the queen in spirituals that wretched family skeleton trotted out once more you refuse to swear to the supremacy a notorious token of an evil willer to the crown campion who was surely what antony wood quaintly calls him a sweet disposition and a well-polished man stated his position once more loosely and with perfect temper began by referring to what passed at the earl of leicester's london house not long since it pleased her majesty to demand of me whether i did acknowledge her to be my queen or no i answered that i did acknowledge her highness not only as my queen but also as my most lawful governess and being further required by her majesty whether i thought the pope might lawfully excommunicate her or no i answered i confess myself an insufficient umpire between her majesty and the pope for so high a controversy whereof neither the certainty is yet known nor the best divines in christendom stand fully resolved i acknowledged her highness as my governor and sovereign i acknowledge her majesty both in fact and by right to the queen i confess an obedience due to the crown as to my temporal head and primate this i said then so i say now if i failed in all i am now ready to supply it what would you more 
i will willingly pay to her majesty what is hers yet i must pay to god what is his then as for excommunicating her majesty it was exacted of me admitting that excommunication were of effect and that the pope had sufficient authority so to do whether then i thought myself discharged of my allegiance or no i said that this was a dangerous question and that they had demanded this demanded my blood admitting why admitting i would admit his authority and then he should excommunicate her i would then do as god should give me grace but i had never admitted any such matter neither ought i to be rested with any such suppositions to all this no rejoinder was made it was the identical position taken up by many another harassed martyr the prosecution next turned to the remaining prisoners using the same weak wrong skirmishing tactics campion often putting in a word to hearten one to defend another to guide a third at a certain point he exclaimed so great are the treasons that i and the others have wrought that the jailer who has us in charge told me at night that would we but go to the anglican services they would pardon us straight away serrano who reports this as the answer to things in general at the close of the proceedings their issue being prearranged campion was allowed to make a speech to the jurors he eloquently begged them to seek for certainties and to remember the character of the evidence brought before him alas he was appealing to bought men who dared not be true the pleadings had taken three hours the jury deliberated or seemed to do so for an hour or more public opinion in the hall as at the tower conferences was overwhelmingly in favour of campion but the poor twelve as alan calls them came back fearful to be found no friend of caesar bringing in a verdict against the whole company as guilty of the said treasons and conspiracies the lord chief justice spoke campion and the rest what can you say why you should not die then campion broke out into a brief appeal to the future and the past a lyric strain such as was not often heard beneath those ancient rafters so sadly used to the spectacle of noble hearts in jeopardy it was not our death that ever we feared we knew that we were not lords of our own lives and therefore for want of answer would not be guilty of our own deaths the only thing that we have now to say is that if our religion do make us traitors we are worthy to be condemned but otherwise we are and have been as true subjects as ever the queen had in condemning us you condemn all your own ancestors all the ancient priests bishops and kings all that was once the glory of england the island of saints and the most devoted child of the see of peter for what have we taught however you may qualify it with the odious name of treason that they did not uniformly teach to be condemned with these old lights not of england only but of the world by their degenerate descendants is both gladness and glory to us god lives posterity will live their judgment is not so liable to corruption as that of those who are now going to sentence us to death after which the lord chief justice pronounced the formula in use for all prisoners condemned to capital punishment ye must go to the place whence ye came there to remain until ye shall be drawn through the open city of london upon hurdles to the place of execution and there be hanged and let down alive and your entrails taken out and burnt in your sight then your heads to be cut off and your bodies to be divided in four parts to be disposed of at her majesty's pleasure and may god have mercy on your souls some of the company raised a storm of protest but a campion's voice rose above theirs crying we praise thee o god Sherwin seconded him with a shouted anthem of eastertide this is the day that the lord hath made let us rejoice to be glad therein like expressions of triumph were presently taken up to the amazement of bystanders then the doomed men were parted and were all taken away edmund campion being put in a barge on the thames and rowed back to the tower where he was heavily shackled with irons and left alone 
End of chapter 12
truth it is i had hoped ere this casting off this body of death to have kissed the precious glorified wounds of my sweet saviour sitting in the throne of his father's own glory there was a good deal of haggling and hesitation on the subject by statute law any caught priest was hangable but public opinion as simpson reminds us in a brilliant page did not always run with the statute law moreover camden says expressly that the queen who is supposed to have supervised and approved all he wrote did not believe in the treasons charged to the silly priests it is remarkable that the first defensive pamphlet put forth by the government after campion's death was one in which the plot of rheims and rome was prudently forgotten the very matter of the indictment by the time the day for the execution was finally set for friday the first of december a third priest had been chosen from the waiting batch of victims as representing the english college at rome this was the blessed alexander bryant who had applied from his prison cell for admission into the society of jesus a fact not known to his persecutors if the entry of his age in the oxford matriculation list be correct as is most likely he was now only in his twenty-sixth year he was grave and gentle in character full of charm and of the most extraordinary personal beauty he had been carried off in the course of a descent on father parson's london rooms starved and parched in the martial sea tortured by needles and kept in the entire darkness of deep dungeons in the tower norton the rackmaster on three occasions proceeded in his own phrase to make him a foot longer than god made him yet he adds that he stood still with express refusal that he would tell the truth the truth meant information of the whereabouts of father parsons a former tutor and devoted friend and of the place where parsons books were being printed bryant had been condemned the day after campion's trial in westminster hall where his angelic looks outlasting a hell of almost unique torment did not pass unnoticed by the public here though some accounts say it was at the scaffold he carried in the palm of his hand and gazed upon often a little cross of rough wood which he had managed to whittle in his cell and on which he had traced an outline in charcoal of the figure of the crucified pedro serrano the secretary of the spanish ambassador saw it taken away from bryant and heard him say you can wrest it from my hand but never from my heart not long afterwards george gilbert died in italy kissing blessed alexander's little cross which he must have taken pains to buy back these three fathers campion sherwin and bryant were led forth on a bitter morning and bound to their hurdles in the rain outside the tower gates campion's life for the past week had been nothing but fasting watching and prayer and he was never in more gallant spirits god save you all gentlemen so he saluted the crowd on first coming out god bless you all and make you all good catholics the two younger men were strapped down on one hurdle side by side campion alone on the other the mud was thick in the unpaved streets of london and the double span of horses each flat hurdle being tied to two tails went at a great pace through cheapside newgate street and holborn there were intervals however when the jolted and bemired prisoners were able to speak with their sympathizers who surged in upon them and thus saved them for the moment from the incessant annoyance of clark and other accompanying fanatics some asked father campion's blessing some spoke in his ear matters of conscience one gentleman courteously bent down and wiped the priest's bespattered face for which charity or haply some sudden moved affection may god reward him says one analyst who saw the kind deed done the new gate spanned the street where the prison named after it stood until yesterday and in a niche of the new gate was still a statue of our lady this father campion reverenced raising his head and his bound body as best he could as he passed under the three martyrs were seen to be smiling nay laughing and the people commented with wonder on their light-heartedness a mile or so of sheer country at the end of the road and tyburn was at hand stark against a cloudy sky with a vast crowd waiting to see the sacrifice more than three thousand horse says serrano in the contemporary letter already quoted and an infinite number of souls and he goes on in the truest catholic temper speaking for himself the ambassador 
and their little circle to say there is no one of us who had not envy of their death just as the hurdles halted the sudden sun shone out and lit up the gallows with its hanging halters father campion was set upon his feet put into the hangman's cart driven under the triangular beams and told to put his head into the noose this the first martyr of the english jesuits did with all meekness then with grave countenance and sweet voice he began to speak as he supposed he was to be allowed to do according to custom he took the text of st paul we are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men we are fools for christ's sake sir francis knowles and other officials promptly interrupted him and reminded him to confess his treason so once more he must needs say i desire you all to bear witness with me that i am thereof altogether innocent i am a catholic man and a priest in that faith have i lived and in that faith do i intend to die if you esteem my religion treason then am i guilty as for other treason i never committed any god is my judge he spoke of the names which he had been hoodwinked into confessing and protested that all the secrets held back were spiritual confidences and that there were no secrets of another nature between his hosts and him he also put in a plea for one richardson imprisoned on account of the decimraciones whereas he knew nothing whatever of that book he then tried to pray but a schoolmaster with lungs named hearn hastily stepped forward and read a novel proclamation first and last of its kind declaring in the queen's name that these men about to be executed were perishing not for religion but for treason diligent reassertion in those days seems to have established anything as a fact the lords and sheriffs present reverted to the bloody question what did master campion think of the bull of pius quintus and the excommunication of the queen and would he renounce the pope of rome he answered wearily that he was a catholic one voice shouted in your catholicism all treason is contained a minister came forward to bid the martyr pray with him but with marked gentleness was denied his will you and i are not one in religion wherefore i pray you content yourself i bar none of prayer but i only desire them of the household of faith to pray with me and in mine agony to say one creed the creed was chosen to signify that he died for the confession of the catholic and apostolic faith he endeavored again to pray probably using aloud the words of some of the vulgate psalm or ritual hymns when a spectator called out angrily to him to pursue his devotions in english i will pray unto god answered campion with all himself in the answer in the language which we both well understand he was again interrupted and ordered to ask forgiveness of the queen and to pray for her but his sweetness and patience held out till the last wherein have i offended her in this am i innocent this is my last speech in this give me credit i have and do pray for her pray you for queen elizabeth was the insinuating query made often and answered often as here campion said yea for elizabeth your queen and my queen and to whom i wish a long quiet reign with all prosperity he had barely finished this emphatic sentence when the cart was drawn away the multitude with one accord swayed and groaned somebody in authority one account names the chamberlain of the royal household lord howard of effingham mercifully forbade the hangman to cut the rope until he was quite dead the other rope with which campion was bound parsons managed to buy and he had it laid about his own neck when he came to die in sixteen ten it is now at stonyhurst a thin frayed old cord some twelve feet long close to the quartering block stood a spectator a young gallant of twenty-three eldest son of a norfolk house who had great gifts of mind and was given to writing verses his name was henry walpole he was a catholic though it would seem a worldly one his generous instincts of humanity however had led him to befriend hunted priests and a love of campion in particular was already kindled in him through this association as the executioner threw the severed limbs of a blessed soul into the great smoking cauldron to parboil them before they were stuck on spikes according to sentence a few drops were splashed out upon henry walpole's doublet the incident roused his mind and pierced his heart 
and was to him the instant cry of his vocation like many another spiritual son of blessed edmund campion and nearer to him than they because he entered the society he was granted the glory of following him through faults of his own through innumerable hardships and through martyrdom at york in april fifteen ninety five into the peace of paradise meanwhile the hangman had seized the second victim saying come sherwin take thou also thy wages that manly man looked upon the bare bloody arm of the other and eager to show some public veneration of his sainted leader first bent forward and kissed it then he leaped into the cart young bryant presently endured death for the faith with an even calmer courage the populace much wrought up over all three went home through the winter mists in tears most of them who had prejudices against the church lost them for good and very many straightway entered her communion the government sent forth publication after publication in lame defense of its action soon france austria italy were inundated with accounts of the event these everywhere produced the deepest impression at home a great tidal wave of conversion to the old church swept in campion's death last and best of his wonderful missionary labors bore the most astonishing fruit the long storm of persecution raged at its full fierceness after fifteen eighty one and it burst over the heads not only of a far more numerous but a far more heroic body edmund campion's spirit had been built in good time as it were into the unsteady wall robert parsons had an intense feeling for his first comrade in arms i understand of the advancement and exaltation of my dear brother campion and his fellows our lord be blessed for it it is the joyfulest news in one respect that ever came to my heart the same feeling breaks out with powerful irony addressing the geneva colored clerics who so long harassed the martyred group of fifteen eighty one their blood will i doubt not fight against your errors and impiety many hundred years after you are passed from the world altogether they are well bestowed upon you you have used them to the best and allen in a private letter says on his part ten thousand sermons would not have published our apostolic faith and religion so winningly as the fragrance of these victims most sweet both to god and to men no remote mystic was edmund campion but a man of his age with much endearing human circumstance about him and in him caring for nothing but the things of the soul he had yet caught the ear and the eye of the nation the tidings of his end meant much to many of the great elizabethans not least personal was it perhaps to the lad shakespeare whose father had been settled as a stout recusant by the warwickshire ministrations of parsons an aged priest gregory gunn came up before the council in fifteen eighty five his thoughts and tongue too busy in campion's praise the day would come he said when a religious house would stand as a votive offering on the spot where the only man in england had perished there was still no sign of such a thing when mr richard simpson's great monograph was first published and that was twenty years before pope leo the thirteenth beatified the blessed edmund campion on december ninth eighteen eighty six but now there is a convent with perpetual adoration in its little chapel and two bright english flags ever leaning against the altar on the ground of the london tiburn and is it wonderful that the vision of a worthier memorial haunts the imagination of those who go there to pray for their country blessed edmund campion was a religious genius with a creative spirituality given to few even among the canonized children of the fold but in his kinship with his place and time his peculiar gentleness his scholarship lightly worn his magic influence his fearless deed and flawless word he was a great elizabethan too he had sacrificed his fame and changed his career he had spent himself for a cause the world can never love and by so doing he has courted the ill will of what passed for history up to our own day but no serious student now mistakes the reason why his own england found no use for her diamond other than the one strange use to which she put him he is sure at last of justice in the church that name of his will have a never dying beauty though it is not quite where it might have been on the secular roll call to understand this is also to rejoice in it for why should we look to find there at all those who are hidden with christ in god end of chapter thirteen 
End of the Blessed Edmund Campion by Louise Imogen Guinea